Well, hello everybody and welcome to the eighth annual Infant Health Policy Summit. Um, can't believe that we're finally able to be back in person for the first time since 2019 when we gathered at the uh, now defunct museum, which we were able to hold an event in just before they um, closed and became part of the Johns Hopkins University uh, campus system. Uh, so it is great to be back here and we were actually also in this room in 2018 for those uh, who were in person with us then. And I would just like to start off with a question. I see so many familiar faces, but I also see some faces that I don't think I have seen before. So raise your hand if you are a repeat attendee, if you have been to this summit before. So about half. And then the other half, raise your hand if this is your first time here. Wow, actually even more than I thought, which is fantastic. Um, well, I just really want to thank everybody for being here and for supporting the work of the National Coalition uh, for Infant Health, of which I serve as executive director. And I also want to thank our very generous sponsors who have made today's event possible, and that is Merck, Prolacta Bioscience, Sanofi, and Sobe. And all four of those companies are doing amazing work for our neonatal population, uh, coming up with new interventions and um, really life-saving medicines to improve the, the quality of their life. So appreciate their support of this event. We have a lot to get to today, a lot of um, interesting discussions we're going to be having. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Christy Gliniak of the National Association of Neonatal Therapists, who's gonna give our opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. I am thrilled to be here with all of you in person at the 8th Annual Infant Health Policy Summit. What a wonderful opportunity. As a certified neonatal therapist, communications manager for Nant, and a clinical professor, I have the privilege to work with infants and families from all walks of life. Supporting infant development and scaffolding early relationships is my job. But frankly, it's so much more than that. It's a daily reminder that these infants, the most vulnerable among us, need protectors, warriors, and advocates so they can get the care that they deserve. You see, like many of you, infant health policy, infant care is so much more than my career. It's about each one of my patients. It's my purpose, it's my family, and it's my passion. Protecting infants, advocating for them, means stepping up to the plate and advancing policies that are in their best interest. Not all babies are born with the same advantages, and not all parents are prepared or equipped to advocate for their child. And that's where we come in. But it requires continuing education, commitment to advocacy, and it requires adults from different states, different backgrounds, fields, to come together and unite. It requires us to constantly step up to the plate and push forward until the job is done. We just constantly need to push forward. I believe that this summit today is an opportunity for all of us to advance together toward a better future for infants. Throughout the program today, we'll hear stories of infants, parents, families, and healthcare providers. We'll explore the policies that shape infant care, and we'll take a look at how we can make a difference. We're gonna ask, how can we raise awareness about current threats to infant health? How can we advocate for policies that protect infants? And how can we reduce the burdens that so many infants and families face? Throughout today's program, we'll tackle these questions and more. We have an exciting lineup for you at today's summit. We're gonna kick it off by hearing from US Representative Alma Adams, a member of Congress from North Carolina's 12th District. She is the founder of the Black Maternal Health Caucus and is an advocate for improving maternal uh, health outcomes and for closing the disparity gap. We'll also hear from US Congressman, or sorry, uh, Representative Bruce Westerman, 
a member of Congress from Arkansas's 4th District, about the threat of RSV. He experienced the cruel reality of RSV personally when his one-month-old uh, son became severely ill after contracting the virus. Today's program will also explore the harm caused by health disparities, ways to address the, the black maternal health crisis, and how to strengthen care teams for infants. We're gonna consider the multifaceted burden of RSV and hear about the work being done to develop uh, accessible immunizations. And finally, we'll discuss nutritional challenges from human donor milk safety to shortages in infant formula. While all of these areas pose significant challenges, we're not just here to discuss problems. Our speakers will also outline the policies and the work that can be done to overcome these challenges and ensure that infants get the care that they deserve. Today's summit is a chance to learn and engage. It's a launch pad for advocacy. It's giving us a fresh perspective and new information and valuable insights. And by taking the time for joining us today, you've shown your dedication and commitment to supporting infants. You've shown your willingness to advocate for policies that give babies the access and care that they deserve. I would urge all of you to take what you've learned here today and support infants wherever you can, uh, whether it be research and development, uh, nonprofit work, legislative advocacy, community outreach, or direct health care. We, all of us, have a role to play in improving the lives and health of infants. We have a lot to cover today. And like you, I'm really excited about this program. Thank you again for joining us. And with that, we'll get things started by hearing from Congresswoman Representative Alma Adams, co-founder and co-chair of the Black Maternal Health Caucus. Good morning, policymakers, healthcare professionals and providers, and patient advocates. I'm Congresswoman Alma Adams, and I'm honored to join you at the 2022 Infant Health Policy Summit. I'm grateful that this eighth annual summit is back in person at the Willard Intercontinental, though unfortunately I couldn't be there in person. Like most members of Congress, I'm back at home in my district for the August work period, which gives us an opportunity to speak directly with our constituents. I do bring you greetings today on behalf of Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, Majority Leader, Sene Hoya, Majority Whip, Jim Clyburn, Minority Leader, Kevin McCarthy, as well as Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, Chair of the Congressional Black Caucus and our 58 members known as the conscience of the Congress. However, even more important than greetings is that we give thanks. So I want to personally thank all of you for your work in infant and maternal health. Thank you. Between COVID-19 and staffing shortages, this is a challenging time for healthcare in the United States and across the world. Solutions are desperately needed. It's also been hard because the delivery of care has never been more politicized. Life-saving measures, including vaccine and mask mandates, as well as social distancing, have sometimes pitted politics and public opinion against public health and science. A couple of weeks ago, I finally got COVID-19, most likely because I was traveling internationally due to my congressional duties. I informed the public of my diagnosis as soon as it was confirmed by a PCR test. I thanked the vaccines and boosters because my case was mild. For the most part, uh, the, the replies were what you would expect, get well soon, get good rest, hope you're okay, what, what you'd expect. Unfortunately, there were many responses that mocked the efficacy of vaccines and boosters. And while we as policymakers and healthcare providers understand that the COVID-19 viruses and variants are rapidly changing 
and that breakthrough cases are generally milder thanks to inoculation, many people either can't or don't want to understand this. Our polarized political environment craves certainty. Uh, the work of science and, and, and healthcare requires a, a stoic skepticism. Being a healthcare provider demands honesty, humility, and the ability to say you don't have all the answers. Politics, too, often sees those values as weaknesses. However, we can't allow politics or partisanship to get in the way of delivering excellent care. And I'm happy to be joining my colleague, Bruce Westerman of, of Arkansas, in speaking with you today. His story of doing everything in his power to help his son, Eli, get healthy is something any parent here can relate to. And though it's hard to overcome the partisan divide, I continue to believe that the solutions to our country's challenges belong exclusively to any political party. And that's why I'm proud to work with another Republican congressman from Arkansas, Representative French Hill, who serves with me as co-chair of the Congressional Bipartisan Historically Black Colleges and Universities Caucus. Today, however, I'm going to take the opportunity to talk about the other caucus I chair, the Black Maternal Health Caucus. I co-founded with my friend and healthcare provider herself, Congresswoman Lauren Underwood. And one of the reasons I find it so important to talk about the work of the Black Maternal Health Caucus is because of how much COVID-19 has changed our world, including for pregnant and new mothers. A good friend of mine gave birth to her first child during the pandemic. And despite having great health insurance and top of the line care, she did not have an easy pregnancy or delivery. It undoubtedly would have been easier for her if she had been able to have normal prenatal visits and more support from family and friends during the pregnancy. But the realities of COVID-19 prevented this. Luckily, she made it home with a beautiful daughter who turns two years old today. My friend also had another advantage that is statistically shown to lead to better maternal health outcomes. She's white. Black maternal mortality and morbidity, in fact, is significantly higher in the United States. And as you know, the maternal health outcomes in our country pale in comparison to other wealthy nations. This bears repeating. In the United States, one of the richest countries in the world, the state of maternal health generally and black maternal health specifically is a crisis. And I know it can be uncomfortable to put things in such stark terms, but the fact remains, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention found that black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women. Thousands of others, including my own daughter, Janelle, have experienced close cause. Compare that with Norway in 2019, which had zero maternal deaths. Zero. Even Beyonce and Serena Williams experienced the dangers of birthing while black. That's right. Some of the richest, most powerful women in the world almost succumbed not to COVID, not to cancer, but to childbirth. Maternal health is an issue absolutely tied to racial health and housing disparities. The historical and structural institution of racism has worked to deny Black parents the ability to have stable housing and economic independence. And so when I think about these inequities, it reminds me of, of some of the most prescient words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who we lost 54 years ago. In the 1966 Convention of Medical, of Medical Committee for Human Rights, Dr. King said, and I quote, of all of the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and the most inhumane. Healthcare is not equal in our country. It never has been. So we shouldn't be surprised when the 
inequality extends to mothers and their children. And as we've seen from the COVID-19 pandemic, the adage is true. When white America comes down with a cold, black America gets pneumonia. Unfortunately, we know the truth. Maternal health in America is in crisis. And like so many crises, the maternal mortality crisis has hit black America harder. And that's why the black maternal health crisis demands urgent attention and serious action to save the lives of black mothers, women of color, and other marginalized women across the country. For me, this work began when my daughter, a black mom herself, survived a complicated pregnancy that almost took her life. Her doctors would not listen to her. She almost died. Janelle was one of the tens of thousands of women who experience near, near misses or pregnancy-related complications that are traumatizing and endanger the life of the mother and or child. And that experience made me think about what it means to be a mom. Janelle is my daughter, a sister, and a mother to two amazing children. And she's also a part of her community. She's a principal at her local elementary school someone who weaves the threads of so many lives together into the fabric of her community. And I thought about what happens when we pull out the threads of all of the mothers we lose every year in this country. So I knew when I got to Congress, I had to do something. It all started in 2018 with Black Maternal Health Week, which then Senator Kamala Harris and I worked on together with the Black Mamas Matter Alliance. And then in 2019, Congresswoman Lauren Underwood and I formed the Black Maternal Health Caucus in Congress. The work of the caucus, caucus grew into policy. And in 2020, I worked with my colleagues, Senator Harris and Congresswoman Underwood to introduce the Black Maternal Health Momnibus. The Momnibus Act makes critical investments in addressing health inequalities funding community-based organizations, growing and diversifying the perinatal workforce, and improving data collection processes. And so with the support of a historic coalition of nearly 200 health providers, Black mothers and policymakers, researchers, activists, and maternal health advocates, we crafted a collaborative, targeted, and timely set of policies to improve maternal health outcomes for Black, pregnant, and postpartum individuals, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. Throughout the process, we remained very intentional about centering the voices of Black women and ensuring Black woman-led organizations are consulted often. The Momnibus makes investments in social determinants of health, community-based organizations, the growth and diversification of the perinatal workforce, improvements in data collection and quality measures, di digital tools like, like telehealth and innovative payment models. Of course, the same week that we introduced the Momnibus, the country went into lockdown for the first time due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we've had to do a lot of work to keep Black maternal health as part of the conversation. As I said, the state of maternal health in this country is a crisis. With the pandemic, it's a crisis within a crisis. And tens of thousands of, of pregnant women have had to struggle while being pregnant or giving birth while experiencing COVID-19. And over the past two and a half years, our country has suffered profound losses due to the pandemic. The value of individuals that how someone can, can touch an entire community has come into clear focus. So when we reintroduced the Momnibus last year, we went from nine bills to 12 bills because we had to have legislation to address immunization, vaccines, as well as COVID-19. Two of these new bills in the package promote maternal vaccination to protect the health and safety of moms and babies and invest in federal programs to address the unique risks 
before and the effects of COVID-19 during and after pregnancy. And so I'll close today by talking about one specific bill in the Momnibus that's very important to me. As you know, social determinants of health disproportionately affect Black Americans, Indigenous Americans, and, and communities of color. There are so many factors that can contribute to the disparities. And much of this is addressed in the Kira Johnson Act, my signature bill in the Momnibus, that is also a part of the Build Back Better Act. Kira Johnson is one of the many moms who we lost too soon. A mistake made during her delivery went unaddressed for several hours and, and ultimately cost her her life. On what was supposed to be one of the happiest days of her life, she bled out while waiting for care. And by the time the doctors realized the problem, it was too late. This story hits close to home because it is so common in our community, so common, in fact, that it reminded me of my daughter's experience after she gave birth. She was in pain, but her, her doctors wouldn't listen. Kira's husband, Charles, has been relentless and brave in, in telling Kira's story. And that's why I was proud to, to name this bill after her. Among other things, the Kira Johnson Act will provide funding for grant programs to implement and study, in, study consistent bias, racism and discrimination trainings for all employees in maternity care session, uh, settings. Specifically, it's important to me that we talk about bias in maternal care because I believe Kira's care team needed this training. And again, that's why we need the mom with us. So if it wasn't clear already, we have policy solutions to this crisis. And let me make this crystal clear. The Black maternal health crisis is preventable. It's preventable. We need to, to pass the momnibus and pass Medicaid expansion. And, and here's why. Many of these maternal deaths are preventable, over 50%. There's no excuse for inaction. We can save these lives and close the maternal mortality and morbidity gap between not only black and white Americans, but also the United States and the rest of the world. We can and must fight for a future where, where mothers and babies are given the tools they need for good health. We need your help. Voice your support online. Call your representatives and senators and tell them to support the momnibus. The momnibus will save the lives of black women and children and improve outcomes for all mothers and parents because no one should have to lose another friend, another auntie, sister, daughter, parent, or mommy to this crisis. Thank you. God bless you, and thank you all again for your hard work to keep our country healthy. Powerful words um, from the Congresswoman there. So we're going to take a quick five-minute break while we get our speakers mic'd up for the next session. So don't go very far, because we have two experts who are going to kind of break down a little bit of what the Congresswoman was talking about. So we'll be back in five minutes.
Please take your seats. Our program will begin in a few minutes. Please take your seats. Our program will begin in a few minutes. Please take your seats. Our program will begin momentarily. Please take your seats. Our program is about to begin. I hope you all enjoyed those remarks from Congresswoman Adams. Um, I thought they were really powerful. She addressed a lot of the things that I think we might be talking about here today. So I want to introduce my panelists. There on the end, we have Dr. Valencia Walker from Nationwide Children's Hospital in Ohio. And then I have here with me uh, Dr. Kanika Harris. She's from an organization called the Black Women's Health Imperative, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about that later. Um, but before we get started, I want to ask really kind of a foundational question. Learn and understand where you both come at the black maternal health crisis from. Where does your perspective come from? What is the kind of work you are doing to try to make an impact on this? So Dr. Walker, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think it's great to start with me because I am a practicing neonatologist. So I take care of pretty much any baby that needs to be in the intensive care unit. And we can understand and appreciate that whatever affects a pregnant person will affect the fetus. And not only that, there's so much that happens in that first year of life around bonding, providing human milk, that really dictates what life is gonna be like, not just in that generation, but every subsequent generation. And I think as someone who has been at the bedside, but also has this you know, sense of connection to communities, and even just my own lived experience, putting all of that together, particularly as a physician, 
personally affects me, and then the work I've been able to do professionally continues to drive why and how I'm here today. Dr. Harris? Yes, so um, the Black Women's Health Imperative started in 1983 by Billy Avery, who really recognized the deficit in um, just maternal health options and care in her hometown while well, she was living in Gainesville, Florida. And so that was kind of like the spearhead of the organization as a reproductive movement. And we really hone in on thinking about data and science, but also thinking about the hierarchy of how we present data. Meaning that a lot of times, as Congresswoman Alma Adams said, um, the perspectives and the thoughts and the insights of black women are often left out of data. It's often left out of how we present data, that storytelling, their stories are really what we maximize in terms of understanding this understanding this crisis and problems. And also, I do come from a, a personal perspective, being a near-miss survivor, losing twins at 32 weeks, um, and um, just a lot of experiences postpartum as well, due to neglect as well. So I come from all those perspectives. Okay. So the Congresswoman said something in there, and I'm sure it resonated with many of you because I mentioned it to you too right before we came on stage and you agreed. Um, she talked about, you know, pulling the thread, you know, sort of out of a quilt when we lose a mother. And I, that was a great analogy because as soon as she said that, in my mind, I visualized one string coming out and the whole blanket kind of falling apart. Um, and she also referenced this statistic, you know, according to the CDC, black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications than white women. So I'd like to hear from both of you and um, Dr. Walker, we can start with you. you know, what do you think are some of the factors that go into contributing to this horrific statistic? Yeah, I think a lot of times when we talk about these statistics, people think, oh, it must be something they're doing wrong or it must be because they're overweight, or it must be they didn't get prenatal care. But what's often left out of these conversations is that the black women that are most likely to die and have complications and their children that are most likely to die and have complications are those with advanced degrees. Women with PhDs, women with MDs, women with JDs. When you start to look at the data overall and break it out, so then we can't say that it's just insurance or lack of insurance. We can't say that it's lack of literacy or education or access. We really have to get at things that make people uncomfortable. It's things that are systemic. It's things that are structural. This is where we start talking about the lasting and ongoing effects of racism. Regardless of the laws that we've passed in the past, there are still things that are happening today and you put all of this together and you start to see how complex these issues are and they don't just fit into a soundbite. They definitely don't fit into a stereotype. Yeah, I think the Congresswoman showed you know, a headline there of you know, Beyonce, Serena Williams, access to excellent medical care, I'm sure that they had, and they still you know, were part of this sort of statistic. So your thoughts on that same question? Yeah, I think we say racism and we don't think about the totality of what it looks like and what it means. And what it really looks like when you think about, um, for example, cultural racism, what it means is that the um, everyday beliefs, customs that promote the assumption um, in the products around white culture is normalized and that's superior. So you're talking about every day you wake up and you have to think about what's not normal about you because it doesn't fit within a white, normal, cultural context. So that's cultural racism. There, I'd be hard pressed to think that any black person in this audience, any person of color doesn't wake up and have to think about what that means. So you're talking about every second, every hour, every day, every week, every, every year of your life, you're thinking about how you fit in or don't fit in and what that means for your life for your children and for your family. Um, and those stressors, they release stress hormones in your body and your body keeps score. So over time, no matter how much you do, either you're succumbing to racism or you're trying to overcome it. 
So when you're talking about getting a JD, a PhD, that's all the things that you've done to not only deal with racism, but then try and overcome racism. And that's an additional stressors, unnecessary stressors in your body. Um, and what that means for pregnancy, sometimes constricting your blood vessels, um, that affects the blood that goes to placenta, that can lead to preterm labor and other things. So that's really how racism works. And the other part of that coin, right, is how you're treated by the maternal health care system. So um, you may show up um, high risk, and then you're blamed for all the reasons that you could be high risk. And then on top of that, you're getting disrespectful care. On top of that, you're not being heard. You are um, misunderstood. You're dealing with what I just learned. I talked about um, clinical inertia, where doctors are just like not paying attention. And then the next doctor reads the charts, and then they're ignoring that. And then it's on and on and on. And so combine these two things, and you have a perfect storm for the crisis that we're looking at today. Can I just piggyback off of that? I mm -hmm. love what you said about how the body keeps the score and all these little things that, to be honest, if we take it a step further, I don't know if I necessarily just wake up and automatically think about it, but at the same time, that idea of being hyper alert. Mm -hmm. As soon as I'm in a situation where I feel like I might be judged or I feel like I'm not being heard, then it's like, what did I miss? What did I not see? How do I need to present myself a certain way, speak a certain way, trying to be heard? There are a lot of different terms for that and things like that, but that has kind of like a continual impact with the release of cortisol and stress hormones. You talked about hypertension. Well, you didn't say it specifically, but you described yeah. it perfectly. Mm -hmm. And we think about what happens with like preeclampsia and all these other issues. But I think most people are unaware of how often we are not heard. Now, let me take that a step further. Most people in here, I believe, are healthcare professionals. You provide care, you've done your training, your experience. You know, how many times have you walked in the room, and particularly for us as physicians, and presumed to be anyone other than the person responsible for the patient's care? You know, people have asked you, oh, I thought you were here to take out the trash. Oh, I thought you were here to bring me my food, or things like that. So many ways that just being a woman often is minimized. And then you have that intersectionality of race and ethnicity, and it just becomes like a spiral. And so there are things that we connect to and relate with, but like you said, we often miss the picture of whose resume gets seen for the job promotion, who gets approved for the housing loan where their water is safe. And then you start to get into a lot of these other things that are constantly coming at you. Yeah feels overwhelming, you know, as to how do we, you know, start to tackle a crisis this big when we've, you know, just here been talking now for probably like seven minutes and, you know, you've touched on all of these sort of things. But um, I want to go back, Dr. Walker, to something that you said in the beginning and it's sort of the angle that you come from and that you're taking care of these babies. So we know that, you know, the health of the mother is extremely important to the outcome for the baby as well. But I would like you to talk to us a little bit about some of the realities that these uh, babies are gonna face when the mother's health, um, when they weren't able to access proper uh, care, if that makes sense. Sure. Well, one, are you more likely to be born premature? I hope I love my job. I think I have one of the best jobs in the world. All my patients have cute little pink toes. Listen, I cannot get in trouble for cuddling with my patients. It's not considered unprofessional, right? At the same time though, I wanna put myself out of business. And when I see especially babies that are delivered, what we say for maternal indications, the baby was okay, but hypertension, preeclampsia, so many other issues that come up. And then when you're born smaller, higher risk of mortality, higher risk of chronic health conditions, we have something called fetal growth restriction. You know, all of these things, and we have this theory in medicine, the fetal origins of adult disease. What happens to you while you're developing inside of the womb your body is already keeping the score before you ever 
exit into the world and take your first breath. And then that, we're learning, has an impact on your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. And so yes, it can feel overwhelming, but I think one of the things we've done is not really kind of illuminated the conversation so that when we see how large the scope is, we realize there's a part for everyone to play. I play my part from, as a clinician, making sure they get the best possible care, making sure they get access to human milk. I also play a part by being here and, and helping with advocacy and policy like we've heard about so far. And so there's so much to do, there's something for everyone to do. So can you elaborate on that a little bit further? Because that was actually gonna be my next question is what can everybody here, you know, we're, Raise your hand if you are a provider. So at least 50% mm -hmm. are providers in here. What are the types of things that we can walk away from here today? So Christy in the opening remarks said, we're not just here to raise awareness, we're not just here to talk about the problems, but we're also here to talk about solutions. And I know it is, you know, we won't come up with all the solutions today, but I want you to elaborate a little bit further on what you think we in the provider community can be doing. Well, I think one, having these types of partnerships because there's only so much you can do and it's important that you do it, but it's also helpful to have people that you can talk to that are really telling you the truth. Because I think most of us come into this with the idea that we are compassionate, that we are kind, that we are treating people equally, irrespective of circumstance or situation. And a lot of times that can be the case. But there are also times where we have to look at the things that trigger our own internal bias and how that plays out and what that looks like and what that sounds like, making fun of a kid's name like, oh, that's so ghetto, or referring to someone as a baby daddy, or presuming that the father doesn't want to be involved and engaged when we create environments, particularly in the NICU, that most men probably don't want to necessarily feel like they're comfortable or a part of. And there are ways that we exclude when we are not really thinking about that family-centered model of care and understanding that family is not always a husband and a wife and a dog and a picket fence, that there are strong ties and connections that need to be honored and respected and heard. So I think that's one of the ways, looking at what our biases are, what trigger them, looking at what you can do individually, but also figuring out where we create barriers. You know, when everything about our care is dictated by our schedule, and not by what works for families? Are we addressing transportation? So we judge families for not being at the bedside, but then we don't really do anything to help them get there, especially when they're often being transferred to someplace where like I am, a level four, this is the highest quaternary care. I have families that are coming from rural areas. I literally had a family say to me, can we please be discharged as soon as possible before it starts snowing? We don't know if our tires are good enough to make it home safely. Yeah. Okay, what do I say to that? But that is a part of my care. And understanding that care goes more than just hanging the right fluids or you know, ordering the right antibiotic. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up and you brought the family-centered care approach. So that's the next discussion we're gonna be having um, with two speakers out there, and I know they're gonna address a couple of the things that you just talked about. Um, Dr. Harris, Black Women's Health Imperative, you talked a little bit about it at the beginning. Um, what kind of work can advocates be doing to help reduce these disparities? We've heard about the provider community. What about the advocates? Um, well, definitely um, supporting the Momnibus Bill is number one. Um, also just finding a way of getting different types of data and information out, using that data and information. It, you know, it can't be just um, whatever data comes from academic journal articles, and that can't be the only information that circulates. Um, I was in a conversation 
um, about doulas and the efficacy of doulas and that there's a not, not enough information to show that they actually prevent maternal mortality. And it's like, yeah, but what data are you gonna get where hospitals are gonna actually, to their own demise, <laughs> show that they're doing the wrong things? And then say, wait, but this non-clinical worker over there actually did the, you probably won't find that. But if you look at the hierarchical, of, if you change the way you're looking at information and knowledge and you talk to enough black women and families, they will tell you um, how a doula saved their lives in many, many different ways, whether it was just the continuum of care over time because they got so many different doctors and those doctors were changed over and they really didn't know who was who and they only got to spend 10 minutes at a time. And, that continuum of care or that a doula was watching them postpartum and noticed something at home and got them and advocated to them to the hospital. Now, would data from hospital data actually translate that? Maybe not. So it's important that we look at all these different types of data as solutions and advocate for that as well. Um, and then I would just also say that, you know, we're just looking at research. We're working with A1, understanding that you know, we can't train our ways out of this. Trainings are great, but you can't train your way out of racism, unfortunately. So um, another way to do that is also along with these trainings, you have to make those structural changes in the hospital so that what people are learning can actually be implemented. I hear from nurses all the time, like I took the implicit bias training, but there's just not enough support in the hospital for me to actually act and use that training. We are gonna have time for a couple more questions and it looks like we will have time for question and answer. We'll, I'll ask um, my colleagues to get our um, microphones ready for that. But Dr. Walker, I might ask you to elaborate on you know, the doulas, midwives. We talked about birthing options when we, we spoke prior to this conference. Um, and that we have seen you know, a reduction in doulas and midwives while we have seen an increase in maternal mortality. So can you talk a little bit up about that? It would be wonderful if we had time to kind of trace the history of how birthing has happened in this country and who has had um, access to resources. But I think if we focus or try to focus on where we are right now, we have a medical system and a medical culture. Remember, I love what I do. And truthfully, the only time I see home births are when they've gone horribly wrong. And it really took me talking to midwives and doulas that were doing fantastic work in the community to start to understand how we need to create a continuum, um, just like we were talking about of care, right? Not everyone needs to be medicalized. Not everyone even needs to be exposed to what happens in the healthcare system. Another thing that we haven't said, but I wanna make sure we say explicitly, so often we come at this from a deficit mindset, what's wrong, what's broken, what needs to be fixed. And I want to encourage people to really think about a strength-based mindset. You know, what people are doing to get it right and how we can encourage that and then transition to where you no longer need those extra like tools and burdens because we are shifting systems. So my last question, a little bit of a lightning round, um, and you, Dr. Harris, already kind of touched on it, I think, what your, I think I know what your answer will be on this, but if you can make one ask of Congress or policymakers, and you knew they were gonna listen, and you knew they were gonna act, which is, you know, um, sometimes pie in the sky, <laughs> uh, but if you knew they were gonna listen to you, and you knew they were gonna act, and they were gonna implement it, what would your one ask be? I think I might surprise you. Um, <laughs> I thought about this question, and I, you know, I, th I think hard about when we, when we talk about maternal health first. Before I just blow it on you, um, when you talk about maternal health, it is a very complicated um, web of problems for this crisis. You're talking about housing. You're talking about prison system, education you know, all these social determinants of health that shouldn't even, we should, not, we should never have to talk about social determinants of health. It should just be a birthright, but we do have to talk about these things. Almost any 
um, result of racism is linked to the maternal health crisis. And so I really can't think of any other way um, to end this crisis. You know, we can, we can talk about momnibus, and momnibus is so important in terms of the policies. I, I support it, I, I agree with it. I think it's the most comprehensive approach. But if we wanna get really comprehensive, we have to start talking about reparations. And what I mean about reparations is, thank you. <laughs> I know it's a word we don't like to use, and I don't mean it in a way of um, paying out to right wrongs. I mean it in a way of redistributing wealth so everyone has a benefit. I, I, have you ever thought of a situation where there's a white person clamoring for their child to get in a black school because that school was so excellent. It's in such a wonderful neighborhood. Like these are things we don't have to think about every day, right? But I have to think about that for my child. And once I put my child in a predominantly white institution, what does that mean for their identity and their growth and their development? What does that mean for the fight of me and my family to make sure my child is seen normal in the way that they are? So that's what I mean by reparations. We're talking about from a child, when a time a child is born, what are the resources that need to be in place so by the time that they have children, they should be able to get the JD, the MD, the PhD, whatever, and walk away from a pregnancy healthy. And remember, walking away from a pregnancy, childbirth healthy, that's the floor. That's not the goal here. That is the floor you want them to feel affirmed, you want their identity to be in place, you want them to experience joy, you want them to be the best part of their lives. And right now we're just talking about surviving. And I just don't see any other way than doing that than to redistribute what we've never ever had. And also when you look at that, you also just have to look at, you know, the average black family only has one tenth of the wealth of a white family, right? So what does, that, what does that really look like for their traje trajectory? And um, you know, if D-Day matters, so does Black Wall Street. We've tried to put things in place for us that have been systematically destroyed, like either violently or just burning towns and, and building um, rivers over them and water structures. So we, we've really tried. And so um, I just think if we don't really look at H.R. 40 that has sat in Congress, if we don't look at that, we're gonna keep working on these small programs, these small policies, these small solutions, and we're gonna profit. We're gonna keep profiting off of the crisis. I think that's really powerful what you said about profiting off of the crisis, because I think we need to switch what profit looks like and what our goals look like. Um, I'm going to kind of take a different frame and approach because one of the things that I think I've been spending more time considering, we have a hard time just prioritizing reproductive health in this country. It is not a safe place. You, you aren't going to necessarily walk away from pregnancy unscathed. It is going to have some type of unmet or harm for way too many people, and we don't talk about that. We don't even really teach that in medical school. And I think once we understand, and, and not just for black people, also for First Nations indigenous people, the numbers are just as atrocious. We have to start centering those that are the most harmed because that's where the solutions go. I'll give you an analogy. How many people might live in an apartment building or live somewhere where you have stairs and you've got to get like furniture up the stairs or groceries up the stairs or things like that. We now require buildings to be ADA compliant. But look at all of us benefiting from the ramps that are in place, from the wider parking spaces, from the elevators that make all of our lives better. We need to take that same priority for the people that have been hurt the most and rather than thinking, oh, they're weak, they need to be saved, thinking this is unacceptable and we all need to be better. And when we think, like I said, when we frame it from a, how do we get to our strengths, where we're all doing better, pregnancy should not be one of the most dangerous periods of a person's life. And right now, that's the case. 
I love that analogy that you, you just used there um, about all the benefits that we have seen, yeah, from an ADA compliant um, country that we live in, and, and why not look at it um, in other areas? So um, we have a couple of minutes for question and answer. I know, I think I saw Deb raise her hand, so we'll bring a microphone to you, Deb, and you can stand up there and ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. I have a mask on. My name is Deb Desenza. Um, I'm a former NICU mom. I run Premi World, and I'm the co-founder of the Alliance for Black NICU Families. I have learned from our member organizations, from partners and other groups, about the atrocious things that are done in the hospital system, in the NICU, and whatnot, um, and in history, too. How do we keep this momentum going? that the changes that we're starting to see, but it doesn't become the one and done. We've done our part for you, we're done. How do we do that? How do we get those reparations in place permanently? How do we do it starting in healthcare, starting with the maternal child health crisis? Because that's my concern. Yeah, and when you say one and done, what do you, can you just elaborate on what you mean by one and done? I didn't know if you meant from a personal clinical perspective or no, like from I, a... I'm thinking from um, political supports, um, institutional supports, and other programs, and then when you have budget cuts, suddenly it's, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, we've already done our part. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned it, um, you talked about, well, I took the training, and so I checked that off my list, my training's done. You know, yeah. is, is that a little bit of kind of like the one and done mentality? I took the training, now I don't have to worry about it? I think, anymore. yeah, I think we just have to keep making um, really some complete cultural shifts. So we're the one and done, the only way you keep the momentum going is, is making cultural shifts in the way that we're looking at birth, the way we're interrogating birth, understanding birth, I think for clinicians, whatever demographic you see in your hospital, figure out a way to get to know that demographic outside of the hospital. So then at least you're less likely to succumb to some of those biases and experiences because you kind of have relationships. I think one of the biggest issues you know, around segregation is that you may see patients and never really have a relationship or know a patient of that skin color, ethnicity, whatever, outside of the hospital. And those are some big shifts and moves that we have to make because we can't really rely on the conditionings that we have to just think that I can just treat this person fairly because I've never interacted, seen, or had a relationship with some person like this outside of the hospital. And so I think um, those kind of shifts and moves are going to happen from everyone um, to start seeing something that's not a one and done because you start caring and valuing people in a different way. So I think you both bring up excellent points. We have to recognize that we didn't get to this space yesterday, last year, five years ago, or even two elections ago. We have to really invest in this and think about it from a generational change. The type of funding that we do doesn't just be one year, two year, five year. It should be 15 year funding, mm -hmm. renewable in 15 more years, generational change. I think that's gonna take a second to get there, to your point, but we also have carrots and sticks, right? When it comes to policy and application, we can start to mandate trauma-informed care. We can start to mandate that institutions demonstrate how they're performing that and add that as a metric. We can start to demand, just like we look at maternal mortality, and make sure that it's every single state is doing that. Every single state should have expanded you know, Medicaid and what we're doing in terms of postpartum care. We have to start looking at these things, again, not as snapshots, not just prenatal care, not just pregnancy care, and postpartum care. It becomes a part of a continuum then you're able to do those culture shifts that no one really likes because they can't really campaign on it, but you're able to tuck that in as you have these more concrete metrics for people to follow. But I think the biggest thing that we need is to shift that mentality from a one-year win and a two-year win to a five-year, a 15-year type of 
generational change. It took generations to get here. We're still feeling the impact of segregation laws that have been banned for decades, but it hasn't changed neighborhoods. It hasn't changed who lives the closest to environmental dump sites. So taking that approach, using carrots and sticks, putting in clear metrics, things like trauma-informed care, which can be mandated as an expectation, and then really looking at shifting from a one-year, two-year win to what are we doing to change things over 15 years, over 30 years? Yeah. I.e. that word, I won't say again. But basically, that's what I mean. Like, you have to have, you know, enough investment, 20-year, 50-year investments to make that change. I mean, we got here over 400 years of intense, you know, um, oppression, and it's going to take something that intense to turn this around. It's going to be taking that type of thinking um, and, you know, and shift to really turn this around. Yeah, it's very frustrating, especially for us as a nonprofit, to know that, hey, we're just gaining some wins, but you decided that you don't want to refund this. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, we, we're, we're getting somewhere here, but it, it was only for three years, and now we have to work um, to, to find more money. So yeah, I totally agree that it's gonna take massive investments um, to get us out of this. Well, Dr. Harris and Dr. Walker, thank you so much for joining us today. Totally appreciate your um, incredible insights that both of you shared. And most of all, thank you for the work that both of you are doing to make an impact on the black maternal health crisis. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Paco and Nicole will welcome you to the stage here. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a background on our next discussion, I'm joined here uh, by Nicole Nyberg and Wakako Eklund, both our healthcare providers, and uh, both care passionately um, and deeply about family-centered care, and I love that Dr. Walker brought that up in her remarks because that's exactly what we're going to be talking about in this discussion. Um, and really, you know, who defines what the essential care team is? How do they come to the conclusion of who is part of a baby's essential care team? And what we'll talk a little bit about is, you know, what the pandemic laid bare, which was that, you know, parents are really considered visitors and not necessarily an essential care team. And I think I've heard this from Kelly Kelly. Many of you know her. She's the founder and uh, executive director of Hand to Hold. She says, I mean, they slap a big sticker on your chest and in big bold letters, it says visitor. You know, that's what you are. You are a visitor. So I'm looking forward to talking to Nicole and Wakako about that. Um, but before we get started, I had a chance to talk with uh, Dr. Mike Heinen. He's Professor Emeritus of Clinical Psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He wasn't able to join us here in person, but he uh, will talk a little bit about his own personal experience and how he has made, um, uh, he'll call it, I don't want to like um, spoil his words, but he calls it uh, a NIPU. A, a, NIC, a needle in, neonatal intensive parenting unit is what he calls it. Instead of a NICU, it's a NIPU. So let's go ahead and roll that video with Dr. Heinen. Professor Heinen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Susan. Before we move into our discussion today about redefining the essential care team for babies, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, first of all, I'm honored to be participating in this summit. And I'm a retired clinical psychologist whose son, Chris, was hospitalized in the Milwaukee County NICU in 1980. Chris's birth changed my life, my research direction, and led me to become a family advocate. So we know the NICU can be a very traumatic uh, place and an experience for families. 
And this is an area of research, as you mentioned, that you have focused on because of your own personal experience. In fact, you just co-authored a paper that stated the following, and I just want to read this, quote, to the parents, a NICU stay for their newborn is never a minor occurrence. Indeed, the trauma is real and can have long-lasting effects, not only on parents' mental health, but also on the bonds they forge with their baby and ultimately on their baby's long-term physical, cognitive, social, behavioral, and emotional development. So would you talk about how your research and how your own personal experience that you mentioned has affected your thoughts on what makes up the essential care team for babies in the NICU? Well, for me, redefining the essential care team is a core piece of the evolution of newborn intensive care. And I view this evolution through two different roles. One relates to the parents' participation as essential caregivers, and the second involves NICU mental health professionals. What I learned as a NICU dad certainly affected my research interests and advocacy for more mental health professionals in the NICU. Chris was hospitalized for 42 days in a small, very family-friendly NICU. Parents and grandparents could come into the NICU 24-7, and we didn't get thrown out during rounds or shift changes. And this was rare even for the average NICU, say, of around 2010. Most NICUs in 1980 had little role for parents. And although my son's NICU was very advanced for its time, my favorite neonatologist had no answer when I asked him what to expect in terms of emotional reactions in myself and my wife, Lauren. There were no published data in 1980. Well, Lauren and I were depressed in varying degrees during those 42 days. Lauren suffered more than I did, but her need to be a mother, a parent, that helped her to will herself out of this episode and to be able to feed and diaper and become parents for Chris in the NICU. Well, it was extremely helpful for our well being. But we both knew that we had been hit by emotional freight trains, and we had sessions with a psychotherapist during the first year. And I also realized that I needed to talk with other NICU parents to help me process this experience. And to my good fortune in 1984, I discovered a group called Parent Care, Parents of Premature and High-Risk Infants. I attended meetings and talked with many parents, and it was those conversations that gave me the idea of studying post-traumatic stress as I heard quite a few parents mention some symptoms of PTSD. And then as time passed, I began to work with colleagues in National Perinatal, the NICU Parent Network, and the Gravens Conference on trying to make things better for future NICU parents. My personal direction came from a talk in the early 1990s that was given by one of the leaders of parent care, Sherry Nance. Sherry expressed the hope in this talk that the goal of neonatology would progress from getting the baby home in the best possible shape to getting the family home in the best possible shape. But before COVID-19 derailed newborn intensive care, there was a nice trajectory of involving parents as members of the essential care team. To get back on track now, we need to emphasize both published data and the importance on parents' involvement and also recommendations from perinatal organizations. For example, there are recent recommendations from the Gravens Consensus Panel on Family-Centered Developmental Care that cite a ton of data highlighting the importance of parents as essential caregivers. For example, the involvement of parents in their baby's care, the greater the involvement, the better the development of the baby. The greater the amount of skin-to-skin -skin care, the less the anxiety of the mother. And my second focus involves NICU mental health professionals as members of the essential care team. 
Nowadays, with a ton of research, it's common knowledge that the experience of a NICU hospitalization increases the likelihood of both depression and post-traumatic stress by about 20 to 30 percent above a childbirth experience that goes smoothly. NICU parents can benefit from as much emotional support as possible from social workers, from parent to parent support in the NICU, psychologist and psychiatry. But being a psychologist, I've long advocated for the inclusion of psychologists on the essential care team. The number of psychologists that work in NICUs has been growing. The membership of the national network of NICU psychologists is now around 150. And my last estimate was that about 18% of NICUs in the country had a psychologist on the floor. Many of them were part time, but it's a beginning. So you kind of mentioned it before things got derailed with COVID-19, you know, that's, uh, you know, as we've talked about, the NICU is already a traumatic experience, but for many families, that uh, trauma was even elevated, more exacerbated due to very restrictive hospital policies that were put in place that separated parents from their babies in the NICU. Now, whether that was due to a mother who tested positive for COVID when she delivered the baby and needing to isolate or the inability for anyone other than one parent or caregiver at a time uh, to be in the NICU with their child. So can you talk to us about this kind of trauma and the kind of grief that is associated with these types of very harmful, very dangerous separation policies? Well, you're certainly correct that in most NICUs, COVID meant that parents and mental health professionals lost their positions as essential providers. At the beginning of COVID, most NICU psychologists were told to work from home. And for some NICUs, they were starting telemedicine from scratch. So you're spot on that COVID-19 made the NICU experience even more traumatic. And it's gonna take decades before all of the research comes in. But in answering your question, I want to elaborate on some overall trauma research that indicates, and really to no surprise, that people respond differently when terrible things happen in their life. And I like the conceptualization of Dr. George Bonanno of Columbia University of terrible events such as the NICU experience plus COVID. And he calls them potentially traumatic events, which may or may not result in a trauma response. From his wide ranging research, Bonanno has identified four trajectories of recovery from potentially traumatic events. And at the positive end of the continuum is the resilience trajectory, which Bonanno argues as being the most common trajectory. And basically resilient NICU parents will still suffer with emotional symptoms, but basically they continue to be able to function. Right? to work and to love using Freud's terms. At the other extreme are parents whose symptoms are so debilitating that they likely have diagnosable mental disorders. And in between are the other two groups in terms of having moderate symptoms. So I fear is that as the COVID data comes in, there will be fewer parents who will be able to be resilient with a corresponding increase in the other three trajectories. And so recognizing this really kind of as Dr. Heidi Alls, rest in peace, has taught us in the past that there ought to be individualized developmental care for babies, depending upon the signs that they display. There also should be individualized care of families in the NICU, depending upon the signs that they display. Here is where NICU mental health professionals can be of immense value. Which trajectory is the parent on? Screening NICU parents for postpartum depression and post-traumatic stress has been difficult to implement in many NICUs, but some form of screening should occur so that NICUs can arrange resources for parents appropriately. And if at all possible, parents with diagnosable conditions or emergency situations 
should receive counseling and psychotherapy in the NICU. And I just, I love sort of the, the message that you're weaving into this, that the parents are part of the essential care team, but also the mental health professional. In addition to the nurses and the neonatologists, those mental health professionals are so key there. So you and your colleagues have written about what you, you know, sort of consider the evolution of the current NICU into a parenting unit. So will you elaborate a little bit on that for us? Sure. Newborn intensive care had been evolving towards what's known as the newborn intensive parenting unit or NIPU. That is until COVID-19 forced NICU care back to before 1970. The concept of the parenting unit began with the Vermont Oxford Network and it was described in a Journal of Perinatology article in 2017 with assistance from some authors from National Perinatal. In a NIPU, care is directed toward the family-infant relationship, not the baby in isolation. The optimization of the mother-father-baby relationship ensures that families get the healthiest start possible. So trauma-informed care, single-family rooms, family-centered developmental care, family-integrated care, they are all components of the NIPU. So the NIPU as a village, it functions as a village, and as you kind of described in your introduction to this, it's, it involves everyone as being members of the care team. And we actually also think about receptionists and custodians as being in their small ways, members of this care team. So it is integrated, it is an interdependent community. And ideally, in the NIPU, the health and the emotional well being of both families and staff are goals that are equal in importance to the health of the baby. If there's one principle that permeates every aspect of the NIPU, is that everyone is looking out for the physical, mental, and emotional health and well being of families, babies, and each other? I like that nip you. And I guess we'll see in the coming years if that uh, can catch on. And we'll see. So, uh, this is my, yes, fingers crossed it catches on. So, um, Mike, this is my last question for you. You know, many advocates are working very hard. We're going to talk to a couple of them in just a few minutes who are working to change these policies um, to ensure that parents are considered, and as you would also say, the mental health professional considered an essential part of the baby's care team. So through your years of research, your own experience, what do you think is needed to change policies so that inevitably during the next public health emergency or worldwide calamity that we have, we do not have these dangerous and harmful policies put back in place? Well, one, I'm sure that Wakako and Nicole will be better able to comment on this because I've never worked in a NICU or never had interactions with any hospital administrators. But from what I've heard, I want to suggest three things. One is that uh, I heard Dr. Linda Frank from Stanford give a presentation to the last Ravens conference. And she urged those who wanted to revive family-centered care during COVID to become best friends with their hospital's risk management and infection control people. Second, use published data and also recommendations from perinatal organizations to make your case. One such recommendation is a position paper recently endorsed by NAN, AWAN, and National Perinatal that supports NICU parents as essential caregivers during COVID. And also pay attention to any publications from those NICUs throughout the world that did not separate families and babies. Early data that I've heard about indicate that many of the fears that may have driven the separation policies may have been unfounded. And lastly, utilize the power of veteran NICU parents who are willing to help in this process. Have these veteran parents assist in designing surveys for your other NICU parents who experience COVID. Have it willing parents take the lead or at least assist you 
in presenting survey data and other data and recommendations from whomever, have them be there at the, with the hospital administrators. And in fact, I know when scenes, I've heard about scenes like this occurring before, and uh, the parents are the ones who are the most able to emotionally communicate the message. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for your insights and for all of your many years and dedication uh, to ensuring um, uh, a NIPU, as we would like to call it, um, way in ensuring that, that parents and the mental health professionals are considered part of their baby's essential care team. So thank you so much, Mike, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Susan. I appreciate it. So he had a lot of really good insights there. Um, but you two are really here representing kind of two organizations who have been working um, towards finding some solutions so that we don't experience these harmful policies again. So um, Nicole, I'll go ahead and start with you. Talk to us a little bit about your organization and what work you are doing to ensure that parents don't necessarily get that big visitor sticker slapped on their chest when they come to see their baby. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, and it's an honor to be here. So um, for me personally, in 2014, just as I had become an NNP, I had started my orientation. Um, I was pregnant with my first child and unfortunately had a lot of complications in my second trimester and ultimately had my son William at 23 and four sevenths weeks. And although being a 23-weeker, he actually did quite well clinically. But once, you know, after I had him, you know, you think you understand what NICU parents go through, but I really had no idea. And so just have the trust that you have to put into caregivers to take care of your baby, to leave your baby, coupled with the uncertainty, anxiety, and fear, it's, um, it, it's pretty indescribable. So once I personally came out of the fog and some of my PTSD and trauma, I created Empowering NICU Parents just as a way that I could hopefully give parents tools and knowledge um, just so they know the questions to ask and so that they can be an active member of the baby's care team. And not just in their cares, but also in the decision-making process. So uh, we do this through um, just even social media channels. Uh, we have an Empowering NICU Parents podcast. And um, I created a NICU Parent Journal, our NICU Roadmap, as well as just trying to speak at conferences to bring awareness to parents and clinicians just how we need to, we have to involve these parents because um, just as Dr. Heinen said, and I was speaking with somebody earlier, you know, there's so much trauma that you go through and we need to start early on, you know, with these mothers that are sitting like myself, I was at home, but still antenatally on bed rest. We need to start there. We need to continue the support throughout the NICU. And then just as um, he said, and I strongly believe in too, we have to find a way to support these families beyond the NICU days because um, just as Neely and I were talking about, you think once you go home, everything's okay. And you know, even if your baby's okay, but you're not, we don't know. There's so much trauma that parents have to deal with. And by engaging them and getting them empowered, the parents will be there. They will do skin to skin care. They'll begin to bond, which we know then positively affects the neurodevelopmental outcomes of the baby, but then the family unit as a whole. Now, Wakako, you're here representing the Council of International Neonatal Nurses. And as we know, you know, COVID was a global pandemic. It was not just here in the United States. And so um, COIN has been doing a lot of work, you know, ex-US um, around this. So we'd just love to hear a little bit more about what COIN's been doing. Thank you for having me here too. And uh, it's been an honor to um, serve on the board of COIN for the last several years. And through that, uh, myself actually being a transplant from Japan also, I have learned an immense um, range of how hospital reacted against parents to kick them out. Knee jerk reaction, so to speak, in some countries. Now, um, COIN has really engaged internationally through WHO and other um, organizations regionally. And also there is a very strong parent advocate, advocacy organization in Europe where they really, very early um, pushed the really strong zero separation uh, message. And we completely helped to try to disseminate that into even, um, I actually translated that into Japanese 
with my colleagues so that the Japanese organization can have a Japanese banner on their Facebook. Um, zero separation really hurt some nurses that I know, meaning mentally they couldn't do it because they are bound by the infection policy of the hospital. Administration um, had to go with the infection department, you know, infectious disease department. And some nurses, I received emails from um, Asia. Basically, I could see the tears in the email that she's crying with the parents that we allow mom to bring, she said, quoted the allowed word, bring breast milk and then tell her to go back, turn around without getting to see her baby. There have been hospitals that did that. Or they had a um, 15 minute slot a week, once a week. So there is a major variation, but just like Dr. Heine mentioned that we heard about hospitals in Belgium, um, never separated anyone and they did not have problems. But COIN, we conducted some webinars, international webinars in August and September in 2020, just to bring the voices together and reach out to them to create discussion among the um, international members to share how they are uh, combating this wave that is pushing the parents back. So um, you talked then about the emotional challenges for the nurses then who you know, want to see the parents in there. But on the flip side of that, what happens when a hospital or a NICU and their providers become used to not seeing parents? What, what happens then? I'd well, love to hear from both of you on that. Sure, um, I'll be brief. Um, we have nurses, and I actually, some of my, my Asian colleagues often say that they are still very restrictive. And many of our US hospitals, I believe, have normalized the uh, parent presence situation quite a bit. Um, in most of our hospitals that I'm affiliated with in Nashville area, I believe that both parents have been with us since probably June or so last year. But just speaking with some um, colleagues in Asia, they are still at a standstill and parents are not present. So these nurses from new graduates from the last two years have never worked with the complex issue of working with parents during their shift, thinking about their socioeconomic needs or their um, family mental um, you know, health needs. Some of the nurses have actually kind of got used to not thinking about the family and that is a harm to them and to us and to the baby's future and parents. Nicole, any thoughts on that one? Yes, I completely agree. I think it's so detrimental that, you know, I, several NICUs, I feel like we were at the trajectory that we were doing so well of including families and not, like I said, just them being at the bedside, but that they were physically there often. They helped with decision making. And I think, unfortunately, after COVID, from the NICU clinicians all the way up to the providers, it's almost become um, a comfortable comfortability that the parents aren't there. So instead of insisting that they're there doing rounds, we're making phone calls afterwards and just updating the parents as opposed to getting their input or their questions during rounds. And I, it definitely, it, it affects the parental role alteration and the ability for parents to feel like parents. And, you know, just as Wakeko said, with the, the nurses, you know, again, there's kind of a, they should come from a coaching aspect when it comes to parents and when they haven't done that or when they've forgotten how to do it, it, it absolutely affects, you know, like I said, the, the baby and their outcome and then the parents as well. Right? Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how the new generation, you know, of nurses, yes, who when they first came into the workforce, well, weren't accustomed to, to that. But as you mentioned, most of the hospitals in the U.S. have relaxed a lot of those policies. But also, we need to make sure that they don't happen when you know, the next um, worldwide pandemic hits, which hopefully will be a while <laughs> before the next one comes. Um, but Wakako, I wanna ask you then, you know, for already um, marginalized communities um, who may already have extra difficulty navigating a NICU journey, maybe because it's cultural barriers, language barriers, how much worse does a separation policy 
make that NICU experience for that family that's already experiencing more challenges. My goodness, I can speak about that for over an hour <laughs> because as a cultural transplant myself, I have always been, even before the pandemic issue, extremely sensitive to how, uh, say, illegal immigrant Hispanic mom, which we usually don't have to know that, but she thinks that we do. This mom thinks that we do. And if we do anything at all that she perceives, oh, that other family, they seem to be talked to more often. They seem to be addressed in a different way, more friendly. In fact, that nurses simply are just possibly afraid to talk to the mom because she doesn't understand Spanish and she does not want to approach a mom and mom is quiet, so assumes that this mom doesn't want to talk to. This happened to a Japanese patient several years ago. This is before pandemic, just because. So that just needs to be extra um, cautiously ingrained into the caregiver side of the brain every minute because um, we don't get to have the, I mean, you know, just updating on the phone using translator is completely not the same as you sit with her, eye level, face to face, be able to hug her, give her, um, say, physical touch and physical encouragement that I care about you. And using even that the iPad translator thing that everybody uses, that is wonderful. But I often uh, make an extra effort to spend time just to ensure that she feels she was talked to. And I often use not the translator not just for the medical discussion or the updates about the babies, but I also tell them, please translate what I say. I understand this is hard. You don't understand the culture of an ICU or language. Please ask the mom what's on her mind. And I personally have spent, and I have discussed this with any nurses I work with, say that let's make sure that this mom whose language is so rare from somewhere in South America, that's not even Spanish, and translation company does not have many translators who can do that particular language. We had some cases like that. We just have to use everything that we have, whether it's our extra smile, touch. Um, I think it's, it's made um, underserved population or cultural language you know, barrier um, situation, definitely difficult during, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I um, asked this of Dr. Heinen and he gave us three points there, but really what is needed to change the minds of those who are making the decisions about these types of policies so that during the next uh, major event, you know, this, this won't happen again. So Nicole, we'll start with you there. I think talking and speaking with families that went through, you know, having a baby, especially during COVID, I had um, a mom that I had grown close to that asked me, she begged me that they, we were allowing um, parents one at a time and her baby was a micro preemie, so it was in our small baby unit. She said, can I have 15 minutes with my husband in there with me? I've never seen him hold our baby. and. I completely agree. I mean, and she said, I'll even take, because it's a smaller unit, she's like, I'll take turns. So we will separate out for, you know, a couple hours if other families want to do that. And I completely agreed with her. So I took it up to the hospital administrators and they said, no, they had to follow the CDC guidelines. And, but it's like, whatever we can do as, you know, all those parents, especially that went through that, or even myself as a parent, I didn't go through that, but I know how difficult it is. I think we have to, um, Talk to administrators so that, like you said, when the next pandemic comes, we cannot separate these parents from their babies. I mean, it is, it's their baby. And I just think people forget that. They see it as a patient, but there should really be no separation between a child and their, their parent. So I think, you know, even coming out of this, we, you know, just the trauma that we were talking about from being a NICU parent, 
these parents that went through the pandemic with having their baby in the NICU, we don't even know. They're gonna go through so much more in the years to come. And then sadly, we don't know the detriment that this is gonna affect the babies because they lost out on skin to skin care. They lost out on bonding. And you know, I was thinking even like back to Columbia when they first figured out kangaroo care, they wouldn't have taken those babies off the mom's chest because the babies wouldn't have survived. So it's just like, we have to get back to the basics. We have to make sure that the parents are part of the care team that they are never called a visitor. Yeah, I, I, it was interesting what he said, which has become best friends with the infection control yes. unit at yes. the hospital, yes. Yes. which I thought was actually a very, very good idea. So Wakako, what I are your said, thoughts? On I that? said the same thing. I said, uh, one of us on the infectious disease committee or COVID committee, you know, put us on it. Um, I'm sorry, I get so e emotional about this issue, but um, I really wonder why can we not make a policy that states that parents are, should be defined as the essential caregiver? And I often argue parents only go to their own child or children. They don't spread around to, other, they don't touch other babies. And we are the more uh, dangerous people because we touch multiple patients and how special it is and we've seen Babies getting delayed with their feeding. I have often noticed that during the week that mom only came once a week, that I told the nurses, let's call this baby by his name as frequently as we can because the sleep awake cycle was not becoming defined, even though week wise, gestational age wise, he should have been. And I could see that it was the mom, lack of a presence of the mom and dad, that he was just not learning to feed. And the, the day mom started to come every day, he reacted differently. So I would love to have a policy at the national level that defines mom and dad as essential caregiver. Because as quickly as everybody shut parents out, it, were you surprised how quickly all the hospitals shut everything down? If something, anything similar happens to that nation, they will do it again if we don't stop it in advance. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have time for questions, so we'll ask to get the, the microphones out. Um, but you're right. We've got to do something. And, you know, I'm not sure is, you know, do you mandate it, you know, at the state level, you know, is it just individual hospital policies? Is it a proclamation by the President of the United States? You know, I'm not quite sure what that is, but it's certainly something that we'll be working with organizations like COIN and empowering NICU parents and really utilizing the voices of the parents who have experienced this firsthand. You know, when I started working with this coalition eight years ago, I didn't know anything about a NICU baby. Um, and it's because I have heard the stories and I have talked to the parents that now I exhibit a level of empathy that I didn't have prior to when I started working with this coalition. And I think that's just natural. When we are not exposed to it, we just don't have the level of empathy that we need. And that's why we need to keep talking about it. And that's why we're talking about it here today. I completely failed to mention an important work that COIN did recently. We have uh, put out a policy statement that's called Keeping Parent and Babies Together. And that's available on our COIN website. And uh, we are trying to raise a voice and do something about it. Yes, thank you. Um, a few questions. Looks like we've got Deb, and then down here in the front, Marsha, I think is her name. Yeah. So I fully agree with the concern about separation of the parents from the child. I think we need to reframe this a bit and do policy changes toward it for the next pandemic, because we know that's going to happen at one point. That baby came from the mother. The mother knew that baby before anyone else. That mother is the expert of her child. That father, also an expert of that child. So to separate them to me just sounds bizarre. So I, I think in pandemic uh, speak, we definitely need to push for better um, CDC guidelines around that because it is going to cause a lot of damage. Uh, because I always tell, the moms and the dads, you are the expert of your child. You knew that baby before anyone else. So for them to suddenly take away that power is wrong because it's gonna it's gonna take it's gonna create 
a real problem for that child, as we've all heard. Yeah. So. And I wonder, I was just thinking, you know, maybe like parents need to have a credential after their name. And that would, you know, help them, you know, to be seen more as part of that essential care. I don't, I don't know what it is, you know. Yeah, P1 for parent or something like that. <laughs> but maybe they need a credential and, and people would take it more seriously. Marsha, here, you have a question? Thanks, just a, just a comment. Um, I'm from Massachusetts and during all of this COVID business when parents were separated from their babies, um, we found that the lactation consultants in the NICUs were also having extreme difficulty trying to help parents breastfeed or express milk when the mother was 40 miles away and here's baby stuck in the hospital and never the twain shall meet. And I'm thinking that when we talk about essential care teams for babies that we need the lactation consultant back on that team because if we can't feed these babies, it, it um, reflects back on the mother. Right. Yes. And this is the, half the stuff I do is helping these parents understand that, you know, interpreting the baby. Why can't this baby feed? What can we do to help this baby feed? And who's got time for that? You know, right. when, you, when you've got a, an IBCLC lactation consultant in the NICU, that's what they do. And so part, part of the issue, that we, at least that we saw, was breastfeeding rates were dropping. Mm -hmm. Babies were not getting the... Um, nourishment and the immune protection that they needed in a pandemic situation. Right. And before we had um, vaccinations, breast milk was the only game in town. Right. That was the only thing that was preventing these babies from getting COVID mm -hmm. when the mother was exposed. And so that's why I just want to put a pitch in here for lactation yes. consultants as essential members of that team. Yes. Yes. Agreed. Any other questions? One in, oh, we've got two here. Great. Well, I wasn't going to say anything, but I'm a lactation consultant, so I was very excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Vanessa, and I'm in the D.C. area. So I guess to kind of go into that, I was thinking a lot, and everybody that's been presenting lactation is always on my mind. I'm a doula as well. But we know that there are hospitals in this country that don't even have lactation uh, support available at all. Um, then we think about some hospitals that have lactation support nine to five. Well, what about the fact that people have babies all hours of the day and night? So I think for a NICU parent, like how, what are things that they can do to advocate for the support that they need around getting human milk to their babies? Nicole, do you want to take that? Oh, it's tough because I think, again, as a NICU parent, you, um, I just feel like they're often reserved and they don't know what to even ask for. But I think a big part of that can come from the NICU clinicians at the bedside and the providers and talking about the importance of milk and then just saying, how can we help you? And because a lot of it is just education and then support because if they don't feel supported through it, um, and like you said, really having them, you know, they're on the weekends and not just, um, it's funny actually because maybe because I was a provider, a lactation consultant did not come and speak with me until I think William had been there for like two months. And then she was trying to talk to me about it to get ready to go home. And luckily I was wise enough to do non-nutritive nursing myself and you know, we, but I never had the success with him actually putting him to breast that I wish I would have. And so you know, we just, I think we need more lactation consultants for sure. And then just, again, the educational component, I think with knowledge comes power and engagement and then they feel empowered, like, especially if they know all of the benefits of what their milk can do. And just like you mentioned, the, you know, anti, you know, like effects of like fighting off infection and things like that. It's just, I think it's just knowledge and education. Yeah. Question back there and then we'll have to wrap it up. Thank you so much to the panelists. My name is Janae Johns, president of Once Upon a Preemie and Micro Preemie Mom. I just wanna connect the dots between the previous panel and this panel for a moment. Reliving my NICU journey and experience, I would have loved to be a part of the essential care team for my son, but I wasn't. 
There was no preemie parent support group. There was no opportunity for me to participate in rounds with my son, although I felt like mommy's gut and mommy intuition was just as important as the medical decisions that were being made for him. Um, as we're thinking about redefining the essential care team for preemie babies, I'd like to position that we think about the role of a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer or a representative from that office to be present on that essential care team for families whose voices are marginalized, ignored, or disregarded. I'd also like to lift up and thank um, respiratory therapists who are also in the room because they were a very important role of me being able to advocate for my son as well as the lactation consultants. Um, I'd also just like to advocate for the role of parent advocates sometimes. So that is someone who may be a part of the family circle, who may not be in the NICU with the parents every day, but there are times as preemie parents when you just don't have the voice and you just don't have the strength to absorb and digest everything that's coming your way for your baby, for and on behalf of your baby. And it could be the sister, it could be the grandmother, it could be the very close friend who's there mentally and emotionally and morally supporting the parents who could also be an advocate um, in the essential care team for babies. So thank you so much for all of the work that you do and for caring for our most precious and prized possessions as well as us preemie parents. Well, um, I feel like Janae wrapped up what I was going to say. <laughs> so thank you, Janae. But absolutely, the OTs, the RTs, the lactation yes. consultants, there are so many people who are part of the essential care team. So thank you, everybody, for all that you're doing. Thank you, Nicole and Wakako, for joining us today. And we will, we're running a few minutes um, behind schedule, which is sort of to be expected with these type of events. But I do want to get to our next discussion. And after that, we will break for lunch. So thank you, Nicole thank and Wakako. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Vincent Smith. I'm a neonatologist in Boston. RSV is a virus that causes a respiratory illness or kind of like a cold. So RSV varies a little bit. If I was to get RSV, I probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference between having a regular cold and having RSV. For a baby who gets RSV, they get what they call bronchiolitis. And, and usually that presents as a kid having a difficult time breathing. Usually you see their little ribs popping in and out as they're trying to breathe. You see their little noses flaring as they're trying to breathe. Sometimes they turn blue because they're not getting enough oxygen. They tend to have a lot of secretions like coming from their nose and a cough. And so it can be pretty significant and it can change really quickly. They can go from being a little happy to suddenly being like really having a really hard time struggling to breathe. Some communities are gonna be at higher risk because the population is more dense, meaning there's more people living together under certain square footage. There's often more children who often tend to pass respiratory illnesses among themselves. You see these families, out of nowhere, they get this like right hook that kind of knocks them out. And, and these people are, are just devastated by this happening to them. And they're like, how much can this kid take? How much can our family take? It's incredibly hard. If you're starting to see signs of, of, of breathing difficulties, don't wait. This is something that you want to take pretty seriously. So that's a video uh, that the coalition produced last year, last October for RSV Awareness Month. But I am joined here by Dr. Domakowski, and he is um, from upstate New York. Upstate, it's upstate, correct? Yep, SUNY Upstate. SUNY Upstate, okay, Upstate, I don't know. Uh, State University of New York. Yeah, yes, State time. University of New York. Um, <clears throat> And he's gonna be talking to us about where we are as it relates to the state of RSV prevention. So this is something uh, that the coalition has been talking about for many years since I've been with it for eight years now. But as Dr. Vincent Smith um, out of Boston talked about in that video, RSV is very serious. And for a lot of infants, they will overcome it on their own. Um, but every infant, not just those born preterm, but all infants are at risk of a serious RSV infection. And there's a couple of really sort of staggering statistics. It is the leading cause of hospitalization for infants under age one in the United States. 
And in fact, infants under age one are 16 times more likely to be hospitalized for RSV than for the flu. But everybody has heard about the flu. Everybody has not heard about RSV, which is very interesting given those two statistics. Um, but I want you to just kind of start um, out by telling us what prevention options do we currently have to deal with RSV? Yeah, I think improving awareness <clears throat> is going to go a long way toward improving prevention. Uh, we, we do a pretty good job at anticipatory guidance, especially coming out of the NICU, but outside of the typical RSV season, we might not be doing that quite so well, the, the providers. You know, RSV is very well known by pediatricians, family medicine docs that take care of a lot of kids and neonatologists. But outside of that, I don't think its disease burden and its real impact is that well appreciated. So awareness. <clears throat> um, we have um, had pelivizumab available for higher risk infants, not term infants in general, but for, um, for preterm pre infants since 1998. And nothing new <laughs> since then. Uh, one of the problems with uh, Synergis, it's a, um, a monoclonal antibody. It has to be given monthly during RSV season so that the levels stay high enough to prevent those infections over the course of potential exposure in the community. Um, and its use has become more and more restricted over the last 20 plus years based on, uh, I think, what relates more to politics than medicine because the labeling indication is for all preterm infants less than 35 weeks gestational age. It doesn't give specific guidance about who among those preterm babies should be identified and get it. Um, currently, the, uh, the guidance says if they were born at 29 weeks gestational age or later and don't have other indications uh, or of higher risk, that they're not eligible. It's alarming, right? They were eligible for so many years and then suddenly it got taken away. So we can talk more about that again uh, in a bit. But um, the other um, non-pharmacologic uh, methods that we have for RSV prevention are all fairly common sense things. Um, new parents sometimes don't have a lot of common sense, at least uh, initially, and they have to be reminded about simple things like hand washing and keeping the sick toddler away from the baby, or even using masks at home when someone's sick. Uh, if you need to really um, be convinced that masking, social distancing, uh, frequent hand washing, all of those things have a high impact to prevent RSV. All you have to do is look at what happened in March of 2020. We were doing RSV clinical trials looking at the impact uh, and the efficacy of some of these new interventions and part of the um, um, trial involved collecting nasal swabs on any of the kids that developed any respiratory tract anything. Uh, March 16th, 2020, boom, everything went away. Now, in upstate New York, RSV season starts in November. We start to see some cases. It picks up over the December and January, peaks in February, and then slowly comes back down, tapering a bit in March, but then we still see it throughout April and then even into the first week of May or so. Not in 2020. <laughs> at March 16th, we didn't see a single kid in our clinical trials with any respiratory symptoms at all going forward. And when November came along, RSV didn't come. December, no RSV. January, February, no RSV. We didn't see it again until the following August. So these non-pharmacologic interventions, when they're used on a mass scale, yeah. work. But is that the solution for this? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so then talk about like why we even need to have interventions for this. Why isn't, um, you know, like a, a maternal passive immunization? Because we know that everybody gets RSV. It's extremely common. I've probably had it a couple times this year. Maybe didn't even know that <laughs> I had it. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it's just a, a sniffles. So why do we even need to have an intervention? Why, why doesn't it... Um, work, I guess, the way some other viruses work. Yeah, so um, babies that are born to moms who um, have had a recent enough tetanus shot, right? They're not gonna get tetanus even if somebody puts a mud pack over their umbilicus that's filled with tetanus spores. Um, because there's maternal immunity, those antibodies cross the placenta, 
they protect the baby uh, for well, four, five, six months, and eventually they kind of wear away as they fade. Uh, there's several examples um, where that's true. Influenza, we know moms that get influenza vaccine during their pregnancy uh, have better outcomes with their babies. We know for pertussis, if we boost the moms during pregnancy from their prior immunization series, then pertussis is gonna be less likely in the first five to six months in their babies. So it's a, a tried and true concept. It doesn't work for RSV, <laughs> why not? Um, that initial RSV infection is not protective. A baby can get RSV twice in the same season. The second infection is typically less severe than the first. Um, even after repeated infections, there's really sort of minor incremental improvements in immunity. Uh, so it really is a challenge. How do we develop a safe and effective vaccine for an infection that leads to hospitalizations that peak at two to three months of life when we don't even have enough time to get a single dose into them yet, right? So th there's a lot of things built in. Yeah. So um, RSV, you know, has been around for a very long time, as we know. Why do you think we have been a little bit slow to come up with a preventive measure for it? It's not for lack of trying. <laughs> um, efforts started in the mid-60s. There were four clinical trials that were done in the 60s that were failed miserably. They were a disaster. Two babies died. Uh, and that, of course, hit the, slammed the brakes on active vaccination programs until uh, a good idea of what had caused that problem um, was understood. Um, but again, we, ha we are dealing with an infection that um, doesn't confer immunity from even a severe infection. So how are you gonna develop a vaccine for something that works when infection, natural course of infection doesn't even can do it? Um, and, and we're talking about very young babies. The peak of hospitalization is around three months of life. Uh, so we gotta get them in, get them protected uh, very, very quickly if we're gonna do it with an active vaccine. And I, I think that um, most, um, m most investigators now in the field uh, don't think that an active vaccination is the answer for uh, changing the landscape of infant RSV. It might be part of the answer come, going forward for kids who remain at risk, but for, for the term newborns in general, I don't think it's um, something that we're going to be doing. But the good news is, is there are um, a few different companies who are working on new innovative methods to offer protection, both directly for the baby, but then also potentially through maternal vaccination as well. So can you talk to us a little bit about the pipeline? What's coming down and what are we seeing? Yeah, so um, I was reminded of a, a discussion I had with one of my early mentors, a very good friend of mine back in the uh, mid 90s. Uh, we were talking about this. Why don't we have an RSV vaccine yet? It's so common. It's 2% of the birth cohorts hospitalized with it, even if they don't have risk factors. Why don't we have a vaccine? We have a vaccine for everything else that infects babies to that same level. And, and she looked at me and she said, you know, this is not going to happen incrementally, little tiny piece by piece. Because if that were going to be successful, since this has been worked on since the late, late 1960s, we would be there by now. So this is gonna happen like a light switch being flipped. And the light switch was flipped in 2014. I can tell you about that. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, tell us about that. Uh, so m most of the efforts for um, active and even passive um, protection against RSV have, um, have targeted the fusion protein on the surface of the virus. So if you, if you think about viruses floating around in the air uh, RSV is one of those viruses that has things sticking out of it. And one of the things sticking out is the F or fusion protein. Now, if you think of that um, naturally, um, that F protein as a sword, sort of a, a dagger like this with a, a handle on the end here, that is the protein that we need to develop immunity to in order to be protected. That's not what we'd been working on since the 60s and even until 2014 when we had the aha moment because there are two forms of the RSV F protein. There's the one that's sitting on the virus because it's floating around. That's the one we want immunity to. And there's another form that happens as soon as that virus touches any cell to try to infect it. 
So imagine that dagger, right? That point part of the sword hits the cell, it retracts, and the, the handles pop open like this. Now you have a completely different tertiary structure protein with only a single antigenic binding site that's common between pre and post fusion F protein. And guess where that site is? And guess what, guess what identifies it? Palavizumab. Complete accident. Just pure luck that that program was developed on something that happened to occur on both post fusion and pre fusion F. So now there's an explosion of progress for active immunization and we also know that the monoclonal antibodies can be fine tuned. We can work on the um, virus binding portion of the antibodies to make them even more powerful, even more neutralizing. And then there's this other trick um, that was developed changing the other side, the stem of the antibody. You know, antibodies are the stem and the, the Y coming up. The stem part binds to cells and the antibody gets taken up by cells. Uh, if there are three amino acid changes in that stem, it changes the half-life of that antibody from 19 to 21 days to up to 100 days. Imagine palivizumab. You know, it's modestly effective at preventing serious RSV and hospitalizations. Uh, imagine that even more powerful with the tweaks at the virus binding portion, so it's much more potent as far as its ability to bind to all the different RSVs that are out there. And now you've taken its half-life from 19 days and brought it all the way out to 90 to 100 days. One dose at the beginning of RSV season with five to six months of protection. That's what we're talking about. It's reality. This isn't something that's gonna happen in 10 years. This is gonna, we're gonna be talking about this next summer. The FDA target date is June, June 23rd, 2023. So then talk to us a little bit about then the difference between, so this is not technically a vaccine. It is a monoclonal antibody. And that raises some other issues, which I'll talk a little bit about, like how are we gonna get coverage for it if in fact it is approved and it comes to market. So talk to us a little bit about the difference between a monoclonal antibody and a vaccine. And then just also a little bit about the maternal vaccine, which is also under development as well. So yeah, so we'll go to the maternal vaccine first. The, um, the natural process would be a mom maybe being infected early on in her pregnancy so that her natural immunity is boosted. So she would get some bump in her, her neutralizing antibody. Those antibodies would be transferred over to the baby and assuming the baby was born at term, baby would get a full complement. And we know those babies born to moms with very high cord blood um, neutralizing antibody to RSV uh, have a delayed first RSV infection. So that's, that's out of Kenya. That's a nice birth cohort study. It was beautiful and it was a proof of concept. So can we take a vaccine and give it to the mother? Let's say a pre-fusion F vaccine, right? So you give it to mom, boost her immunity to the really juicy good stuff, really high titer antibodies, the best of the best type of protection. If the baby's born close to or at term, baby gets all of that, theoretically should be protected. Um, with a not, it was a quasi prefusion F that didn't work so well. The, the company that ran that study published their phase three results and they did not meet their clinical endpoint. Pfizer is telling us that they have met their endpoint for their phase two study and are going to be launching their big phase three. The GSK, also a prefusion F during pregnancy, um, is, um, is on hold. Uh, they had some safety signals in the birth outcomes and the data safety monitoring groups have decided to hold until they got more of the, the babies delivered and could see if higher numbers really show that that was a true association. So that's where we are. But um, just think about if we go with maternal immunizations going forward, the logistics of giving mothers another vaccine during pregnancy, it was hard enough to get moms, pregnant moms to take flu vaccines and Tdap vaccines, right? So how long would it take to actually make a big enough difference to get enough moms immunized um, to, to see a, a good result? Well, now that we have these long, you know, long half-life monoclonal antibodies that are looking so promising from, from both Merck 
uh, and a, a partnership between AstraZeneca and Sanofi Pasteur, which is actually the same company that developed Metamune, or Metamune that developed Pelavizumab. Um, I don't think we need to focus as much on that possibility because if we can give a dose to a baby in the newborn nursery, and we know the pharmacokinetics, we know exactly the levels we're gonna achieve, we know if that baby was term or not, we don't have to fuss and guess about which moms got the vaccine, when they got it in the pregnancy compared to when the baby was born, et cetera, et cetera. So it simplifies the logistics. Sure. So how does a monoclonal antibody differ from a vaccine? So um, let's say, um, let's formalize the definitions a bit because I think this is gonna be important for some of our advocacy and some of the politics. Not for the science, because I think generally the, the science is well understood when we're bantering about this. Let's call immunizations, the, the bridging, the, the umbrella, immunizations. We have passive immunizations and we have active immunizations. Passive immunizations are like the monoclonal antibodies. It's like tetanus immune globulin that we give if a child has a tetanus prone injury and, and hasn't had enough doses of vaccine. Uh, passive protection, meaning short term but immediate protection against the infection of interest. Uh, active vaccination is usually done as a series of vaccines, um, and we call, we call those vaccines, or we can call them active immunization. So we have immunizations, active and passive. Passive are the antibody programs, like the monoclonals that we're talking about, and active is uh, the, the synonym there is vaccines. Vaccine, the term comes from vaca, which is Latin for cow, which was the original vaccine, right? Because cowpox was initially used as a, the smallpox vaccine. So that's why active vaccines are, <clears throat> are preferred to be referred to as the, the vaccines. But if you use the jargon passive or active immunization, everyone will know what you're talking about. And that's, I think, what we should do with the ACIP and what we should do with the legislators because it, it simplifies it a bit, and it's also very true. There, there's no hiding anything um, so that we can get this, uh, these new products from Sanofi and AstraZeneca and Merck evaluated as immunizations, right? Yes. Uh, in the context of also in the future, maybe even having active immunizations added to the programs. Yes, so I'm glad you brought up the immunization umbrella there. So um, I think that's gonna be really important when it comes uh, to coverage because we know that even though it's a monoclonal antibody, it may not have the word vaccine in it. And we sort of uh, think about, oh, the vaccines for children program. Well, that's only vaccines. But really, they're providing immunization to our country's children. And so making sure that we can have that fall under uh, that immunization uh, umbrella is really important. So the National Coalition for Infant Health released a position paper earlier this year on the need to include these new innovative monoclonal antibodies in the Vaccines for Children program because um, they sort of meet the definition of what is a vaccine and what is an immunization. And ultimately the goal is to improve public health to reduce the burden of an infectious disease. And that is why we have the Vaccines for Children program. So that paper really just sort of outlined some of the key points of, of why it would be a very good idea <laughs> to include these in the Vaccines for Children program because one issue we could run into is if we do not have uh, that widespread coverage, uh, there could exacerbate existing disparities for children who have private insurance versus those uh, who have Medicaid. It guarantees it. Yeah, you're right, not even a possibility. It guarantees uh, that there will be those disparities there. And that ultimately, it will not aid in reducing the burden of RSV if we cannot get all infants protected against it. Um, so I, I wanna ask you, from a research and development standpoint, then what, how, how important of a role does good coverage policies play as companies are thinking about what they're going to develop next and put in their pipeline? Yeah, so I, I think we learned a hard lesson with Palavizumab about this because the traditional uh, um, manner in which a new vaccine is uh, approved and then recommended for use in the US is first the FDA looks at all of the data, make sure it's safe and make sure it's effective. 
and then says yes or no. Um, they don't offer, the FDA does not offer uh, recommendations or guidance or guidelines on how to actually implement that. Instead, a parallel federal agency called the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices also separately and independently reviews all of those data and makes their recommendation and, and their vote known to the CDC. So the CDC actually is um, the agency that develops guidance and recommendations for how new vaccines are to be used. Uh, that didn't happen with Palavizumab because ACIP never got involved. So it, related to some your comment earlier, it was not considered an immunization in 1998, and ACIP declined. Even though they were also, they were already recommending how um, rabies immune globulin should be used with rabies vaccine, and and how botulism um, antitoxin would be given, which is a, a polyclonal antibody for people exposed to or infected with botulism. Uh, for, for reasons that are unclear, they decided not to jump in. And so the agency that um, made the first rounds of recommendations for Pelavizumab uh, continued to make those recommendations going forward, and the members changed. And when some of the members that were able to advocate for broader use left the committee, um, others that had strong voices were heard more loudly and the data actually weren't, uh, in my opinion, weren't vetted the same way they would be from an ACIP review. So I think it's a, uh, well, the ACIP has already agreed to review uh, these new um, products under their umbrella. Um, and uh, the hope is when that vote happens and that vote gets conveyed to the CDC, to, to Dr. Walensky, that there will be a parallel vote for including uh, these new products under the entitlement program, Vaccines for Children. That would mean that um, there's no impact from when the, the administration changes one to the other. It's an entitlement, and it would mean that these products would be um, available at no charge to those who are underinsured or uninsured who, are un who have not yet become um, 19 years of age in the U.S. So it's a big deal to add it, and it's a bit, a bit of a lift, but I think the, the lift of having the ACIP um, assigned to review it and having them agree to do so, I, I think that's a, a big chunk of it. And I, I think this next step, if it happens, it is a beautiful thing, and it, it, it's the right thing. Yeah, agree with that. And the coalition um, has developed um, an RSV awareness campaign that we've been working on heavily for the last year. And as part of that, we have also put together a parent advisory council, a parent and caregiver advisory council of uh, parents whose children were um, heavily impacted by RSV. And we have actually had them engage directly with the ACIP in submitting sort of like comments and letters, just simply talking to demonstrate the burden and the impact and again, sort of that level of empathy that some people who have never experienced may not have. Um, and so we're gonna be continuing to tell those stories at upcoming meetings of the ACIP and engaging those parents um, to make sure that we can get those included in the VFC because ultimately that is what will help to reduce the burden of RSV. Absolutely. If, if it's not included in VFC, it, um, it's not impossible, but it, it will throw a wrench and things be a little bit more difficult, I guess. Yes, um, a absolutely. And I think that moving, f moving forward, if um, we don't do everything we can to ensure th that level of coverage, uh, if these monoclonals, these long-acting, very high-potency monoclonals are used as they are intended, it's theoretically possible that they'd be recommended for all children under their, in their first year of life for their first RSV season, one dose and done, offers five to six months of protection. But if, if we don't meet those fi financial and economic goals, then, and we um, undercover or they, they get priced too expensive and we don't use them, there's no way it's gonna change anything. We have the potential here to change the landscape of RSV. 10% uh, of all hospitalizations in children's hospitals, not just in the winter, 10% every month, you know, if you average them out every month, are, are secondary to RSV. The economists are concerned enough about the potential 
of this change in the landscape of RSV, they're already evaluating what they're going to do uh, to try to recover that loss, 10% loss that's gonna happen. That's how encouraging these things are. I mean, it's gonna happen starting within the next year. Yeah, very exciting. So I think my final question for you is, and you touched on this a little bit, that the preventive measures that we took for COVID, we saw a decrease in RSV cases, but realistically, that's not a long-term solution to continue to wear, you know, social distance and those types of things. Um, so I'm curious to get your opinion on why we saw then the seasonality of RSV change. So normally it's, you know, roughly October, you know, through March or April, but once everybody took the masks off and we started to, you know, be in close quarters again, it started to appear in the summertime, yeah. and it's not followed its normal schedule. So I'm curious if you have any insight And it did it all that. over the world. Australia reported it first, and then everybody else said, yeah, we're seeing that too. So I, I really believe that this has something to do with the fact that RSV is with us all the time, but there's environmental factors, climate factors, uh, maybe um, my personal guess right now is um, changes in dew point that allow um, transmission to occur more readily in those periods of time when RSV is much more common. Now, if that's part of the answer, that's all it is, is part of the answer. I think much of this is unexplained, uh, but there's a consequence to missing that, that RSV season. You know, it's seasonal, it's predictable as far as that it's gonna come and do this horrible thing, and pediatricians are dreading it every year, uh, and then it didn't come, but the consequence, of course, uh, when we just looked at our own data was that when it came back, the area under the curve for the time period it came back, even though it was off season, was almost double of what our typical seasons were pre-COVID. So we didn't really gain anything. We just delayed those infections for another year for the kids that didn't get it in their first year of life. Very interesting. Um, well, we appreciate you coming and sharing this insight. It's definitely an exciting time. Um, to be working in the RSV space, a lot of advocacy we've been doing, so it's, it's, we're very hopeful, cautiously optimistic that these new monoclonal antibodies, you know, will be able to be covered through the VFC and we will be able to uh, not have to see these infants suffer anymore, reduce those hospitalizations, which again, as the economists would love, you know, to see this, it's a burden on the healthcare system from a financial perspective for sure, so. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Joe Mikowski. And what I'm gonna do is we're gonna wrap up by showing a quick video. Um, this is a family out of Chicago. Uh, Melanie and her husband and children uh, were severely impacted by RSV and I had a chance to go out there and talk to them uh, several months ago. So this is a newer video from the coalition. We will watch that video and then immediately after that, we'll break for lunch. Life in the Rogers house is very chaotic. <laughs> my name is Melanie and this is my husband Dan um, and we live in the suburbs of Chicago with our four kids. Our kids are nine and that's Dylan, six, that's Reagan, and then we have twins that are three, Austin and Holden. Reagan was four months old. She woke up in the morning and I could tell that her breathing was not right. Those 10 days in the hospital were grueling. They were exhausting. The one word I would use to describe the RSV experience is helpless. I had never even heard of RSV before, so it's like, oh, they have RSV, and you're like, well, what's that? Her breathing was not right. She was breathing very deeply, very quickly, and it, it was really scary. It's basically a waiting game. When they finally did tell us that we could go home, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't panicking, thinking, can I do this at home by myself? It's very frustrating because there's nothing we can do to speed up the process of them getting better and you're just stuck. As a family of six that tried to do what we could to keep them from it, we still got it with the twins. Everyone who's had a child or has dealt with hospitalizations, the bills don't all come at once. They start trickling in. You don't really know when they're gonna stop. You have all the emotions flowing through when it's happening. You feel helpless because you're there with your child in the hospital, and then you feel guilty because you're not at home with the other children. It can be really scary with how contagious it is. You really need to trust your instinct with something like this, because even though some may say it's just a cold, these babies cannot handle it, and they need the supportive care, and they need the help. Don't be afraid to call your pediatrician's emergency line in the middle of the night if you're worried about their breathing. Don't be afraid to show up at the ER when you're not comfortable with your baby's breathing. 
This is not something to take lightly. It's very scary and you feel very helpless and this is just something that we shouldn't have to watch our children go through. So we'll break for lunch now.
Please take your seats. Our program will begin in a few minutes. Please take your seats. Our program will begin momentarily.
Please take your seats. Our program is about to begin. I hope everybody is enjoying their lunch. So we're gonna watch a quick video, as was the case with Congresswoman Adams. Uh, Congressman Westerman, who she referenced actually in her remarks to us, is a congressman uh, from the state of Arkansas who has a very personal experience when his um, infant son was hospitalized. I think it was about 21 years ago. Um, I think he told me that his son, I think, just graduated from college. So. Um, we'll go ahead and just, as you're finishing up your lunch, we'll go ahead and watch uh, my interview with Congressman Westerman. Thank you so much, Congressman Westerman, for joining us today and for sharing this very personal experience and that you and your family had to deal with. Thank you, Susan. It's good to be with you today. So you've had the unfortunate experience, as have many parents who have had a child come down with RSV. And unfortunately, your situation was um, was worse than some parents even face in that your son was hospitalized. So I just kind of want to ask you um, a few questions. I, I guess I first want to start off is if you had to describe the RSV experience using one or two words, what might those be? We'll probably use the words anxious and uh, helpless. Uh, you know, we were we were new parents. Uh, my son was only a month old when he got RSV, and you know we found out later that you know all kids probably are going to get RSV, and the older they are, the least problem they have with it. But um, you know he was a he was a month old, a newborn, and here we are, new parents trying to do the right thing, and uh, here's our our little boy in a plastic bubble in the hospital with very low oxygen levels, with uh, some very concerned pediatricians and talking about, uh, you know, how they might need to airlift him to Arkansas Children's Hospital. So uh, we wanted to do the right thing and we were very concerned about him, but, um, you know, there was really nothing we could do. We had to just rely on the, the medical professionals who did a great job. So had you or your wife ever heard of RSV before your son was diagnosed? Yeah, we, we had heard of it and, uh, you know, probably not given a lot of thought to it. I've had nephew or nephew and nieces, and I think they had all had RSV at some point in time, but they were all older when they, they got it. But uh, my wife, who, who read up on all the, uh, the child care books a lot more than I did, she was very aware of of uh, this wasn't a good thing for our son to have it at such an early age. So, and I know, um, you know, this was quite some time ago. In fact, your son is 26 years old now, but thinking back on that experience, do you remember what it was that made you and your wife think, uh, something just isn't right. I think we need to take him to the doctor. Did you take him to the doctor and then they sent him to the hospital or did you go directly to the hospital? I believe we went to the pediatrician and she checked him out and admitted him to the hospital. Okay. Uh, she, uh, I guess, his parents, you just can tell even with a newborn and inexperienced parents, you can tell when something's not right. 
and we knew that something definitely wasn't right. Uh, so took him to the pediatrician and she admitted him to the hospital. Okay. So tell us a little bit about that hospitalization. You described him as being in, I think, a, a plastic bubble, you said. Uh, so just kind of talk through, I guess, also from just the parent perspective, not necessarily the clinical side of things, but as just the parent perspective, seeing your child in such a vulnerable state, knowing that, you know, there is uh, not necessarily medication that can be used to treat this. It's more just kind of supportive care. So talk about it as, as parents and as a father, what that feels like. Well, you obviously want to uh, hold your baby, and when they're in a in a bubble like that, you can't um, you can't hold them in your arms without some barrier between you. Uh, so that's tough. And then just seeing uh, you know the the medical procedures they had to do, putting an IV into an infant, um, it's you know their veins are so tiny, and it's really hard to do. And uh, you know they they didn't get the IV in um, correctly to begin with, and they had to. Um, I think they ended up putting one in his in his foot. They they kept having to move it around, so it just you know hurt you to see that happening. And the little baby obviously uh, was feeling pain, but didn't know what was happening. Yeah, what would you say was the scariest part of the whole experience? I think when the pediatrician came in and told us that this was uh, a severe case and. Uh, there's a possibility they would need to airlift him to Arkansas Children's Hospital. And then uh, she also told us there was uh, an experimental drug on the market uh, that uh, you know, she couldn't guarantee it would work, but she thought uh, we, she needed to give him those, those treatments. And then she told us, you know, I'm just letting you know your insurance doesn't cover this. And I think at the time she said it was five thousand dollars per dose and she was recommended that he needed like five doses of it so in uh, in 1995 as young parents um a twenty five thousand dollar bill that wasn't going to be covered by insurance is a pretty staggering thought when you think about it but when it's your child there you know she could have told me it was fifty thousand dollars a uh, dose and he needed ten and you're going to say okay do what you think he needs to to get better so you know so it was a lot of money but money becomes secondary when you're looking at your child's life on the line yeah right what do you think you that you wish you and your wife had maybe known before uh, your son was diagnosed with rsv yeah i don't know that there's anything that I, I wish we had known. My, my wife was very cautious about taking him out when he was uh, just an infant. And uh, probably we've got four children, and I'd say she was still more cautious with the first one uh, than, than the three that came after him. So it's not like uh, we were doing things to expose him. Uh, he was born in November, so you're in the wintertime. And, um, you know, I guess the RSV is probably more prevalent then, but I can't say that, you know, I wish we hadn't have done this or I wish we had known this because I think we were being cautious as parents. But uh, as, as you know, these viruses, they, they somehow get through the precautions that you try to put in place. Yes, RSV is definitely ubiquitous. You know, they say almost all children will have an RSV infection by the time they are two years old. Um, so you're a policymaker and you have a captive audience here today. So what role do you see policymakers playing um, in trying to reduce the burden of RSV, both on the infant themselves, on the healthcare system? And then we know that that burden that families feel, whether it be financial, and you talked about that, but also the emotional burden of, of having a child hospitalized with RSV. What do you think role, the role is policymakers can play? Well, one of the things where I think uh, policy and government fit into healthcare is in research. And, you know, I'm a huge proponent of federally backed research. It's proven to save money and save lives in the long run. Uh, so anytime we can fund more research to find those, uh, those cures, I think that was called ribavirin, if I'm not mistaken, which is probably common now. It was uh, it was pretty new back uh, when they gave it to my son, but I'm just thankful that somebody had funded research and somebody had done the research and that 
drug was available when the, the pediatrician said that he needed it. So I, I see government's role more in, in helping with research and we need to speed the process up on getting uh, new drugs to the market. And we've got to be uh, cautious with, uh, you know, with all the trials and the tests. But we saw with the uh, coronavirus how fast uh, uh, vaccines could be uh, put on the market. Now, are they totally effective? No, people are still getting the uh, getting COVID after having multiple shots. But uh, from everything I've seen, people who have been vaccinated are surviving those uh, those later bouts a lot better. And, you know, it was, it was truly amazing how fast that vaccine was developed. Um, and it just shows the potential we have when we really focus on those areas. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Congressman, I really appreciate you sharing your story with us today. You know, we have a room full of advocates. We have some policymakers. Um, we've got health officials, all sorts of people with us today. And one of the things that the coalition has been focusing on for the last several years is RSV. And we have kind of really put um, the pedal to the metal, as you might say, this year, as we have potential new therapies that are that are coming down the pike that are in development that could offer protection, no guarantees at this point, but could offer protection to infants. So uh, we look forward to working with policymakers like yourselves to ensuring that when new medications and therapies come to market, patients ultimately can access them. So they don't run into those barriers that, you know, you you talked about the $5,000 a bill, um, you know, for those shots for your son, but ensuring that um, every family, regardless of their financial um, means, would be able to protect their child. So thank you, Congressman Westerman, for being here with us today. Well, thank you, Susan. I'll just add that uh, my my son, he went on and uh, was a National Merit Scholar and graduated from uh, Yale University with a chemical engineering and a classic civilizations degree. So uh, he, he came through his RSV just fine. And I'd also say that you ask about emotional support. We had a very close uh, church family that was there for us, plus our immediate family. And uh, it's important to have support during those times. So uh, I can't stress that enough, uh, how people were surrounding us and meeting the needs that we had while we were focusing on our, our child, even though we felt helpless there. So thank you for the work that you all are doing. I'm glad I got a chance to share with you. Great, thank you so much. Yeah. So appreciate Congressman Westerman sharing those thoughts with us. That's kind of a tough thing about having a summit in Washington in August as everybody's out on their August work period. So none of them are usually ever here in town uh, to join us in person, but appreciate his remarks. I just wanted to flag one thing. Um, Secretary Pete Buttigieg, who is the current Secretary of Transportation for the United States, adopted twins with his husband about a year ago. I think they just celebrated their first birthday. They had a very, very scary experience. Um, you know, the news reports came out about this probably nine months ago or so. And from the sounds of it, it sounded like one of his twins had RSV and that's what they were hospitalized with, but they didn't really disclose what the condition was in the news stories other than to say their child had been on a ventilator, for quite a, and was in um, the pediatric intensive care unit for quite some time. Well, he just recently released a very long form article uh, detailing he and his family's experience, and indeed it was RSV. And um, you know, his twin, um, the twin's son, did almost succumb to that. But fortunately, both twins just celebrated their first birthday. So I say that because. Um, RSV impacts everybody. It does not matter what your position in life is, how much money you have, what your race is, what religion you belong to, it does not matter. Um, all infants are at risk of RSV. And it's because people like Congressman Westerman and Pete Buttigieg are going to help elevate and raise awareness. And so many people are gonna be able to you know, hear their story and it's gonna help immensely in helping parents to, to know how it is they can protect their child. So I just happened to read that article yesterday. Um, I cannot remember what outlet it was in, but I encourage you all to go and read that. It was a great article. So with that, I will go ahead and welcome my colleague, Amanda Conchafter from the Alliance for Patient Access for our next discussion.
Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Amanda Conshafter, Communications Director for the Alliance for Patient Access, which is a longtime partner of the National Coalition for Infant Health. And I'm excited to be here today to talk about quality and safety of donor human milk. And I have two experts here to discuss the issue with me. So to my immediate left, we have Dr. Sandra Sullivan from the University of Florida's Department of Pediatrics, Division of Neonatology. And we also have Liesl Sheehan from Prolacta Bioscience. Now, you'll notice your program tells you that Allie Fuller will be participating in this panel. Allie, unfortunately, wasn't feeling well today, but we're delighted to have her colleague Liesl here to, uh, to have the conversation with us. So with that, we'll dive right in. Uh, it's been a big year for infant nutrition in the news. So we've all obviously seen headlines about infant formula and some of the challenges there. And then just recently, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out, as I'm sure many of you saw, and acknowledged the value of breast milk for infants, not just in the first year of life, but for the first two years of life, and encouraged nursing mothers to continue breastfeeding for, for the duration of those two years. So this conversation today feels very timely. And, and I'm excited to hear from the two of you. So let's start with a little bit of level setting, if we can. So Dr. Sullivan, I may start with you. When we say donor human milk, what are we talking about here? Who's donating, who's receiving, who's benefiting, and, and how does the process work? We could talk a long time about that, so I'll keep it short. <laughs> um, I think you actually have to really be very specific. When we are talking today, we're talking about donor human milk that has been given, um, provided to milk banks or processing centers from mothers who have excess. And then it is processed and distributed primarily to hospitals, sometimes to outpatients. Um, but when you say donor human milk, sometimes that can mean um, fresh donor milk, milk sharing, there, there are lots of ways that milk change, exchanges hands in the world. Um, what we're talking about is ensuring safety of that donor human milk. So we're talking about bio burden reduced milk that is screened and processed and then distributed to primarily hospitals. Um, again, maybe to outpatients in, in some settings, but um, it's um, the people who are donating are generally Mothers who were who delivered term babies, and those babies are now three to six months old, generally speaking, um, and they find they have excess milk for whatever reason, and so they contact Milk Bank. Um, they go through a screening process similar to blood donation, uh, but it's a little bit different because when you donate blood, you're right there in person, and everyone knows it came from you. When you're donating milk, you thankfully don't have to go to a milk donation center and pump right there. Right? That would be ridiculous. So, um, but there is so so then you, as as an uh, an industry, sort of lose a bit of security there, knowing where that milk came from. Right? You have to trust that that milk came from whoever sent it to you. So there there that's why we're talking about ensuring safety. Is there you know maybe. Perfect, maybe we're doing perfectly well, but there may be ways that we can do a little bit better. And then the majority of the milk is going to hospitals to the neonatal intensive care unit babies. Um, some to other parts of the hospital, some to outpatients or babies or children, young, young children with um, significant gastrointestinal disorders um, or rare conditions. But the vast majority is going to neonatal intensive care units. And to there, those babies, even in the neonatal intensive care unit, it's primarily going to the smaller, more fragile infants. So those who weigh um, less than two to three pounds, depending on the, the hospital administration's delineation of where they cut off. And so the challenge there is that moms maybe want to breastfeed, but cannot or cannot in the quantities that the baby needs. Talk to us a little bit about kind of who's on the receiving end, what some of the challenges are there. Sure. <clears throat> so on the receiving end, um, the direct recipient is, is this little tiny human, right, who we obsess over every milliliter and every microgram and everything that goes into them, right? Um, so that's the ultimate recipient for most of us and who I think should be um, 
the bar for which we set safety. We want to make sure it's safe enough for them. And then anyone who is more mature or more able to handle different variations, great, that's wonderful, but the bar should be set for those extremely fragile, tiny humans. Um, most of the time in the NICU, there's a, there are, depending on the size of your NICU, there are a couple of moms who can produce a lot of milk and probably could provide the milk for all the babies in the unit if you had your own internal um, milk processing unit. But the vast majority of moms in the NICU, for whatever reason, whether it's part of why they were delivered early, if it was a maternal complication, a maternal illness that went along that goes with not being able to produce enough milk, or it's just, I think, as we've heard a lot about, the environment of the NICU is not ideal for anyone. I say we all leave the NICU like this. The doctors, the babies, the nurses, everyone leaves like this. Um, it's not ideal. There's a lot of stress involved, and whether they have to go back to work or whether they just don't want to pump in a unit with 25 other people staring at them or whatever the, the case is, um, there are some moms who try as hard as they can and do everything exactly like they're supposed to, and they power pump, and they get up in the middle of the night, and, and they do all of the things, and they drink water, and they eat, and they sleep. I don't know how they do it all, but they do, and they still can never provide the amount of milk that the baby needs. And then there are some moms who just don't, but because the risks of not getting human milk to some of the babies, I mean, the American Academy of Pediatrics says all babies should be exclusively breast milk fed for six months, right? And so these are the tiniest humans and we need to feed them something. And we know that breast milk is important for all babies. We have lots of literature that says Breast milk is extremely important in these babies and life-saving for most of them. And so they, um, we have to feed them something while we're helping the moms try to figure out or those moms who are, have contraindications and just cannot provide breast milk. It's too important for these babies to have human milk. So donor milk is becoming more and more available and pretty much standard care for certain gestational ages and birth weights, I would say, across the country. And then trying to expand it more, but based on balancing cost and supply and, um, and old habits. Sure, be difficult. sure. So Liesl, when this process works well, it sounds like you have the moms with an oversupply, you have the, the young, fragile infants who need this milk, they're getting it, everything works out well. But I suspect there are some challenges that arise. There are some risks sort of inherent in, in this process. I wonder if you might talk us through that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> we're grateful for everything every donor does to get more milk out to more babies, but there are risks that are inherent, and that can uh, range from the milk itself that may have an adulterant in it. It can range from unclean um, breast pump pieces. Um, it can range all the way to the manufacturing or um, pasteurization process and the delivery to the baby themselves. So um, when a mom pumps, she could have um, a virus that she's unaware of or zero converted. Um, there could be bacteria because the breast pump is maybe just not quite cleaned enough. Totally an innocent thing. I've certainly been there myself. Um, <clears throat> or it could be bacteria. She could have been exposed, for example, to nicotine, secondhand smoke, and um, then the nicotine ends up in the breast milk. So the pasteurization process can be highly effective in addressing that issue, but the pasteurization process in and of itself brings risks as well. So um, bacteria can develop through pasteurization. I think you know we learned that the hard way this year with the infant formula crisis. Um, we saw bacteria pop up there, and even though that's powdered, there's plenty of unfortunately fatal bacteria that can emerge from water, in the waterborne pasteurization process. So um, we need to make sure that we're addressing risk there, and then all the way through um, mixing the donor milk and giving it to the infant. So there's unfortunately risk that exists, certainly risk that is manageable um, with proper oversight. So thinking about these risks, Dr. Sullivan, what does it look like for the infant? I mean, you were talking about how small, how fragile some of these infants are. If some of these contaminants do get through unnoticed, how does that impact the baby? I think it, there are lots of ways you could look at this. For the general two-month-old who was born at term and is healthy and is 
um, adopted and the adoptive mother is providing donor milk, I think the ability to that baby to accept some impurities or, um, or unintended exposures to infections is much better than when we're talking about a one pound baby whose skin is not even a barrier to the world, right? Every time we touch a baby, we risk that baby getting infected from our touch after we've cleaned, after we've done. So anything can cause problems. Um, the vast majority, a room full of, of, at least half full of lactation consultants like myself know how important breast milk is, right? So for me to say, oh gosh, you know, if there's any risk in breast milk, it's the risk of not getting breast milk. But many women can choose for themselves what kind of risks they're gonna give to their babies. This is, this is not that, right? I, as a, as a physician, Dr. Walker out there is the, the other neonatologist. You know, we have to, we have to um, trust that this milk is as safe as it can be for these very fragile humans, um, and that includes any kind of substances as well, not just infections. Pasteurization is wonderful for infections, but it doesn't remove substances. I mean, you know, the beauty of of human milk is that it it invites, it welcomes your baby to the environment right? Taste, smell, touch, all the things. It's good for your baby to be exposed to the environment. Unless your baby's not supposed to be in the environment yet, it's supposed to still be sheltered, right? So we have to be careful. So knowing what's in that milk, or more importantly, knowing what's not in that milk, and knowing that there isn't you know, THC. Would I say to a mother, I'm not going to use your milk? Some, may, some people do. Maybe I'll use a different one. Nicotine. <laughs> um, you know, what I say to a mother who uses nicotine, your baby's born at 23 weeks, it's so important they get breast milk and your milk has so much in it, it's great, but you have nicotine, so we're not gonna use it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that because the benefits of her fresh milk are so huge, it outweighs that little tiny bit of risk. Pasteurized milk doesn't have, it has some benefits, more than formula, but not quite as many as mom's fresh milk. So where does that balance come with a little bit of risk of nicotine what do, we, what do we know? I don't know. Maybe in 25 years we'll say, no, nicotine's horrible for babies. We would never give them that like we do with cocaine now. No, I would never give cocaine, right? But I don't know that now about nicotine. It's emerging and trying to find ways to, um, to know what the long-term effects are of specific things. There's so much in milk. I think trying to make sure that we know there aren't specific medications that would have interactions we give babies lots of medications that mothers get in their milk and they get exposed to. So it's not the, the situation of is this component, is this chemical dangerous to the baby? It's knowing that that chemical is there or knowing that that chemical isn't there because it may have interactions with the things we are doing to the baby or it may have implications that we don't know are in there. Right? We, the baby may act strange and we say, well, I don't, I don't know. One particular one for specifically that I know is not is tested in a lot of the world and not in most of the milk banks in North America is um, the Bacillus serious toxin and Staph aureus endotoxins. So there are spores and toxins that, again, pasteurization kills the bacteria, but these particular bacteria are really smart and they made things that are heat stable. So there's still stuff in the milk that doesn't come out when you culture it, so you think it's good, but you put it in the baby in, a, in an environment between 40 and, and 115 degrees, and it blossoms. And then you end up with a sick baby, but the, the bacteria is not there, so you can't culture it, so you can't treat it with antibiotics, but you have the effects of what the bacteria would have done if it was still alive. So there's things that are important to know that are not in milk mm -hmm. um, because they can affect these very fragile humans. Whereas, again, you know, older babies, um, it may not be the same, but I think the bar should really be set for the most fragile population and making sure that they're safe and everyone else is safer by default. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So it sounds like you're saying that it depends a little bit on kind of the baby, his self or herself, how old they are, how, you know, what the gestational age was at birth, but then also it's not so much that you want to weed out so we only have the purest of the purest of pure milk, but just knowing what's in there yes. so that you can understand right. anything that happens, understand interactions. Okay. So you know, thinking about all of those factors, Liesl, I'm curious, 
Does donor milk receive the same level of scrutiny from the FDA, for example, as infant formula might? It actually does not. Um, so donor milk is currently regulated as a food. So basically the same regulation as a brownie you might pick up at the gas station or a container of or milk. lunch. Or lunch, yep. Um, but a container of milk that you're going to pick up at the grocery store or the gas station actually has to meet the pasteurized milk ordinance in addition to the food regulations. Donor human milk doesn't even have to meet a pasteurized milk ordinance. Um, so we feel like it, you know we need a little bit of extra scrutiny to make sure that we're addressing the risks. Um, the place where we've looked is um, exempt infant formula, which can really, I know, be kind of scary to think of calling breast milk um, infant formula, but it addresses the fact that it's a human tissue and gives the FDA the ability to determine how do we make sure that we're feeding um, a high quality product to infants. But the other side of it is that that opens up access and makes sure that we're getting more donor milk out there because right now there's a lot of hesitancy to cover donor milk. So for example, the uh, WIC removed um, coverage of donor milk back in 2000 due to risks in donor milk and lack of regulation and safety standards. They've not put it back in place. Um, think of how many infants could have access to donor milk if their regulations are in place and WIC could cover it. Insurers, Medicaid, they feel the same way. So. Um, making sure that the right level of scrutiny is there can not only help make sure we have um, the right safest, best milk out there for infants, but really increase who has access to it. Yeah, yeah when my kids want to get the brownies at the gas station, I say no. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. So it's interesting that you mentioned WIC and then the idea <coughs> that actually not having enough regulation is, is creating access barriers essentially, right, to yeah. for a lot of families and a lot of young children. Yeah. And WIC is the largest formula distributor in our country. Right, yeah, interesting. So I, I wonder then, it seems like the movement then is toward more regulation. I'm curious, Dr. Sullivan, maybe you can address this for us. Where, where has this gone on the policy level? I think state and then also federal policymakers have sort of had their eye on this issue, but just curious to know what progress have we seen and, and what comes next? Yes, um, I will start because I have um, a fun story which I will run out of time, so anybody who wants to hear more, let me know. <laughs> um, uh, but Liesl's definitely the policy expert. Um, so last year in Florida, where I hail, the legislature had a donor milk bill that didn't pass, and like it's been years of trying to pass this, this donor milk bill. And so this year the legislature put in a stipulation that asked the Agency for Healthcare Administration, or ACA, who manages our Medicaid coverage in Florida to study the use of human milk in the NICU with some very specific things they wanted looked at. And as a scientist, study to me was like, oh, okay, how are we gonna do this? But it really was a report for the legislature, so it was great because we put together, we did a bunch of, of searching and put together a huge team and um, contracted by ACA to this, this medical school quality network. Um, so myself and, and some other um, professors, academicians, got together and trying to explain to them that this was not a research study, that we didn't have to go to the IRB, that we didn't have to get consent, and all these things was, was fun. But pretty much we got to um, email, we emailed all of the hospitals that had NICUs. I learned so many things, like there is no centralized listing of NICUs in the state of Florida. <laughs> Shocking. Um, learned a lot of things. But we emailed all the hospitals. 60% um, of them responded, which sounds, you know, actually not terrible for a survey, but not nearly close enough to what we wanted. But those 60% who responded represented 82% of the NICU beds in Florida, so we decided that was pretty good. It included pretty much all of the big centers, and so the people who didn't respond were really the smaller level twos who were outside the range of using donor milk for the most part. So we, we kind of assumed they would not have had a lot to add to the, to the study. Um, and we got to say, you must answer this because ACA says so. And so they did. <laughs> uh, it's a great way to get information. Um, so in doing that, we were able to look at how donor milk is used. And it was illuminating because it is just variable. There, there's so much variation in 
who it gets used for, when it gets used, for how long, when they come off, how they come off, which fortifiers are used for the tiny babies, um, just so many things. Uh, and, and the couple of centers that did not use it, there were five small level two centers that said they don't use it because they just don't have enough of those patients. And one big center that said we don't use it because we can't afford it. Um, and so then looking at the map in Florida, you could see there were over 50% of the counties in Florida who didn't, don't have a hospital that would be able to meet the needs of the infants. They would have to be transferred to somewhere else. And so by just sheer geography, where you live, where you're born, um, could dictate whether you got donor milk or not with the same, you know, just if you were born here, you would get it, but if you were born here, you didn't. And that's not fair to the babies, right? That's, that seems wrong. Uh, so it was very helpful in, we, we turned in the report and that was used to help shape the donor milk bill that was um, filed this past year. I don't know which session it is. Yep. Um, it was filed and uh, it did not reflect the work that the work group had done when I read the bill and I looked it up and because I was interested now invested in following it. Um, it's a real hook. Um, so I looked it up and followed it and said, oh, it's, you know, it doesn't say anything about, this is completely opposite of what we just spent four months and I spent 30 hours a day, you know the feeling, <laughs> um, working on. So I called, I emailed my representative and senator and said, we need to talk. <laughs> we need to talk about this because I, you know, this must change. This can't go through this way. So we were, worked with both collaborators, um, the academicians, all things. So we ended up being able to shape the policy more to reflect what the work group found in Florida. Um, and it passed unanimously through every committee. So um, Florida is, and, and Washington, thank you. <laughs> Florida and Washington in the same day, or the same week, got both had bills that were very similar that signed um, into law provision of donor milk for for Medicaid for certain um, populations. And I worked with the doctors up in Washington for that too. We're currently working in Ohio to assist. Um, there's a, some legislation going on in Ohio and we're trying to, I'm trying to be helpful <laughs> um, there as well. And then we do have some national legislation called the Donor Milk Safety Act uh, introduced by Dr. Delor, doc, Dr. Um, Rep Congresswoman, Congresswoman yeah. Delaro. Um, which essentially um, is, is what we did in Florida. It's basically just setting standards. And right now each state has a separate set of standards. So you know, New York has their own licensing and, and things that need to be done for a milk bank to, pro to work in that state. Florida is set by the Department of Health. Somebody else is set by you know, a different Department of Health. So we have 51 different, if we had legislation in every state, it would be 51 different pieces of, of um, guidelines that would have to be followed. And this would be a national blanket that would make it much easier to access milk in all states um, and provide uniform regulations or guidelines or standardized minimum safety standards for all the milk that's provided in, in the US. And there are lots of, of milk banks and milk processing centers in the country. And, and um, there's a lot of emotion attached to it. But, but there are certainly you know, better ways of doing things and less better ways of doing things. It's all human milk, so when you get, really get down to it, like, how can any of it be bad? But we don't, we're not saying any of it's bad, just saying that it maybe could be better and it at least should be uniform. And, and I think it should at least meet as, as an alternative to mother's own milk, it should at least meet the safety standards that our infant formula makers have to follow, mm -hmm. right? Because it's still an alternative to mother's milk. Um, and so I think our babies deserve at least that, that much. Mm -hmm. so. Liesl, anything you would add to that? Um, no, I think that that's great. I mean, we've, we have seen many states, actually over half a dozen in the last couple of years that have passed um, donor milk uh, and donor milk derivative reimbursement for both commercial coverage and for Medicaid, which is 
tremendous progress. Mm -hmm. A lot of states want to do it. Unfortunately, a lot of states are getting caught up, kind of like Sandra said, they are getting caught up in um, the Department of Health doesn't necessarily know how to get the right regulation in place. So they keep looking to the federal government to say, how can we do this? So New Jersey, for example, passed reimbursement um, in 2017. They're trying to get this out there. They wanted reimbursement um, during the form when the formula crisis started and they still want it. <clears throat> they keep asking the federal government to help them because they can't figure out how to put the guidelines out internally. So that's five years where babies weren't able to have access to donor milk because the Department of Health couldn't figure out how to do it and needed help. So, you know, it's important to make sure that we are getting these right guidelines in place, that the FDA is stepping up and doing their part, and that's going to help babies everywhere. Well, let me ask this, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. We've talked a lot about how increasing and, and standardizing some of the regulations and kind of rhyme and reason to how all this works would help improve access. But I think that there are, there are those who would say, you know, is this regulation really necessary or is it going to actually make it more difficult for some families to access donor milk? What, what are the sort of unintended consequences that we need to look out for with this issue? I think it's always smart to look out for unintended consequences. <laughs> Certainly not something we want to have here, but something we're on high alert for. We are um, <clears throat> trying to make sure that the federal government does look at this holistically. So can they address coverage as they address regulation? Can they provide support to um, milk banks and donor milk providers to make sure that they can meet any of the regulations that may be in place. And um, certainly we think something like working under exempt infant formula gives flexibility to the FDA to make sure that we are not bumping up against unintended consequences and not accidentally cutting off any access, that we're doing the opposite. Um, but that's also why we want everybody at the table working on this to make sure that we get it right and we don't run into unintended consequences, that we just get more milk out there, safe milk out there, and help more babies. Yeah. And I think still it's amazing to me how many people don't know that this is a possibility. Right. So just the awareness of talking about it and talking to people. I still meet residents and other physicians, attending physicians in the hospital and say, what about donor milk? And they look at me like, what's that? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so I think um, just awareness is is one part of it, and then also awareness about regulations. So a lot of people that I've talked with who we all think we know what's going on. I didn't know what I didn't know until I spent a summer researching every continental guideline for safety. Right? I had them spread all over my living room from Europe and Australia and North America, and it was, you know, it, it was astounding to see what's out there and compare them. And, um, I think that just awareness of, of this is the first is the first unnecessary step, and and hopefully we can move this through um, quickly, especially in light of the infant formula shortages right. and issues that were related to safety, <laughs> causing the shortages. Um, hopefully, this is a great time, but even if not, it at least is getting some awareness out there so that people can start thinking about it and talking about it and having hard conversations with people. No, it's a great point, the awareness factor. You know, there's, there's so much energy put into the do you nurse, do you not nurse debate that I don't think there's a lot of conversation about donor milk and the role that it can play. So. And because it's been very hard to get, because it's not reimbursed. Right. So hospitals are paying for it or patients or parents are paying for it out of pocket at home. Mm -hmm. And so if there's a way to get it reimbursed and the, and the people who are paying for it want regulations to be able to reimburse it. I mean, really, um, it's, it's boggled me why this is a difficult issue. I know it is. I know there are nuances that I don't understand, um, but I feel like ooh, step one, regulate it. Step two, pay for it. Step three, everybody gets it. <laughs> All right, any questions from the audience? Deb, I see your hand up. I think Lauren has a mic for you. What do you think this will have an effect on with the milk sharing moms? The ones that are putting it out on Craigslist and all that, do you think that will wipe it out, this regulation? Um, I'm gonna speculate and say, no, there's always a fraction okay. that are going to. And 
as a pediatrician and as a lactation consultant, I cannot encourage or condone the sharing of milk, but as a person who understands the benefits of human milk, I would rather feed my baby. I shared my milk with people, let's just put it that way. Someone else could decide what they were gonna feed their baby, but I think most milk is very safe. If you know where it's coming from, and that's where this is, if you know where it's coming from and you know what things may or may not be in it, that's one thing. I think sharing is one thing, selling on Craigslist, is a very dangerous yes. thing. And, and we know from, from actual studies that people have done that that is um, problematic in many ways, right? So, so I don't think it's going to have a huge impact. I'm hopeful that more people will donate their milk so that it can be processed and utilized. Um, it's not that there's not need, right? There's clearly need because people are providing it and taking it and, and, and accept, accepting it, not taking it, but accepting it. Um, so there's clearly need. I just, uh, I think that, that hopefully more women will be more open to donating it. A lot of people just don't even know that exists. But, yeah. Do you have anything to add? Uh, one more question. Go ahead. Uh, hi, so thank you so much for just um, providing this information to us. Uh, excellent, uh, really, really, really important work. Thank you so much. One of the things that I have encountered moving from Oh, hold on, let me stand up. <laughs> My mom said stand up. Okay. Um, one of the things that I've encountered moving from California to Ohio, so there's definitely a different culture around um, breastfeeding, chest feeding, um, or even just pumping and providing milk. And, and this is just my own personal anecdote, not implying anything you know, evidence-based, but people are often put off by the idea of using human milk, <laughs> and they feel that it's weird, it's wrong, uh, formula is, is safer, it's, it's something they understand. And I'm just curious how to address those concerns and ways that we can think about that both at the individual and at the larger kind of community level in terms of education. That's a whole separate panel. <laughs> but <laughs> if either of you wants to respond just in 30 seconds or so, please do. We saw a huge shift, not far enough, but definitely a huge shift going through a quality improvement program by the CDC several years ago, Best Fed Beginnings, that resulted in designation as a baby-friendly hospital, which really helped with the prenatal. And, and I think that is by far the most important. You and I know we can go to a mom after she's delivered at 23 weeks and say, I need your milk. And she, if, if I said I need your blood, she would just you know, slit her wrists over the baby, right? So, the, in a good way. <laughs> so, um, I think that prenatal education, and honestly, I think New York has, I haven't lived in New York, but I've read about the breastfeeding curriculum they have in their K through 12 schools, so I think Women have decided whether they're gonna breastfeed or not before they get pregnant most of the time. So it's hard to make that choice. We have reasons in the NICU where we can twist their arms, but that isn't the best way to do it. I think just instilling it and slowly moving culture ideally is the best way, yeah. I still have physicians I work with who are like, oh, can I just take this formula off the shelf? I know what's in this. And I think, mm -hmm. no, you can't. <laughs> but I think putting a little bit of, um, assurance, right, that it's properly, there's proper oversight um, will help parents, right, because a, a parent or an individual doesn't think twice when a doctor says we need to give you a blood transfusion um, because they know there's oversight, right, they know that that has um, been tested and is a safe product for them. I think being able to assure parents that the product they're getting is safe um, and that it has been tested and the FDA knows what's going on is probably going to help address that a little bit too. All right, well, thank you both. We're actually gonna wrap this panel up by introducing a new video from the National Coalition for Infant Health on this issue of safety and quality of donor milk. So we can roll the video. The early years in a child's life are a pivotal time. Optimal nutrition is important for baby's growth and learning. Many mothers rely on breast milk, which is packed with nutrients and can even help protect babies from sickness. But while breast milk gives babies a boost, 
not all mothers are able to provide it for their babies. Donor human milk can help fill the gaps. Mothers with excess milk may donate it to a local milk bank or organization, which process the milk to provide nutrition to vulnerable babies. Their donations make it possible for more babies to receive the proven benefits of human milk. But while access to donor human milk is critical, so is ensuring its safety. Babies should be able to receive donor human milk that's safe and free from viruses, bacteria, and other substances. Some regulations are in place, but federal policies need to be improved to ensure the safety of donor human milk. Under current FDA policies, donor human milk is considered a food product. That means it's not as closely regulated as other products like infant formula, even though they both serve the same purpose and it's up to individual milk banks to come up with their own quality and safety guidelines. This lack of standardized regulations can introduce short-term and long-term risks to babies. But with appropriate oversight, moms can access donor human milk that is as safe as other nutrition. Improved regulations will ensure human milk donations will receive high quality testing, processing, and evaluation. Babies can access optimal nutrition and moms can sleep easy knowing their baby is safe and healthy. Learn more at infanthealth.org. So I am pleased to be joined by our last discussion of the day. I have Suzanne Stabler here just to my left. She's a neonatal nurse practitioner and a professor of nursing at the Emory University School of Nursing and also joined down there on the end by Val Jensen who is with us from the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research drug shortage staff at the Food and Drug Administration. So I got all that got in there correctly. Um, and what we want to talk about today is, you know, we just was kind of mentioned briefly. We've heard a lot about shortages, uh, generally even unrelated to healthcare. There seems to be a shortage of everything out there right now. Um, and they touched on formula a little bit. And we're actually going to hear uh, from a colleague of, of Val a little bit later via video recorded remarks really about the infant formula shortage, just to give us a little bit of an update there. Um, but I want to talk about something that might be familiar to a lot of the clinicians here who are in the room today, which is some of the shortages outside of infant formula that are impacting our NICU patients, um, whether that be for a specific medication, a device, um, another type of product, uh, you know, the syringes, tubing lines, like you name it, um, all sorts of shortages that we've been experiencing. So Suzanne, I, I want to start with you here. Um, when we hear about a drug shortage or product shortage that is affecting the NICU population, can you give us a couple real world examples of what those might be? Sure. Um, Currently in my practice, every morning when I arrive in the NICU and we get ready to start taking care of patients, we have a morning huddle and we discuss anything in shortage, including nursing staff, which is a vital resource. But we talk about formulas, we talk about especially specialty formulas that may impact the care we're giving. Um, we talk about things such as TPN components, we talk about medications. Um, currently, across the country, there's a shortage of the tubing and filtering systems utilized to manufacture um, the components in parenteral nutrition. And so, as well as some um, cartridges used to analyze blood gases. And so, we, we start our day with those types of discussions. So then if you have a couple of shortages that day, including your nursing staff, I'd be curious to hear about that. Um, how does that ultimately affect the care you're delivering to the patient? Um, I would like to say it doesn't impact our care, but the real world um, truth is it absolutely impacts our care. So a few months ago, we had a shortage of dextrose solution and I was totally blown away with the fact that, what do you mean we are on a shortage of D10? Um, for those of you who are nurses or providers in the room, I, I just couldn't even comprehend that. And so, of course, that day I had a patient who had hypoglycemia, and so instead of a two to three minute process where I asked the nurse to go to the Pixis, draw up the solution and give it to the baby and we alter IV rates in order to treat that hypoglycemia, 
I now have to put an order into the electronic medical record. It has to be seen by the pharmacist in the pharmacy. Then they have to go under the hood, draw up the solution in a sterile fashion because if they don't, the entire bag of solution then has to be wasted. And when it's on shortage, you want to be able to utilize as much of that as possible. So what used to be a two to three minute process to treat hypoglycemia becomes a 15 to 20 minute process on the best day. If it's during daylight hours, if it's at night, it could be even longer because you only have one person in the pharmacy in some hospitals. So Val, what is the root cause of these Shortages. I mean, we're hearing so much about shortages right now. You know, we've got tankers off the coast of California that can't get into dock, you know, for these. I mean, and those might be for electronics, you know, I'm, I'm sort of being playful here. But, like, what is a root cause of a shortage like that? Sure. So, um, at FDA, we take uh, shortages are definitely our top priority right now, and, and they have been for years. As you all know, it's been an ongoing problem for years. Um, so when we looked at the root causes, and, and we did this at the request of Congress in 2019, and we published a report um, with, about the root causes as well as enduring solutions. And our economists, as well as um, many other experts in FDA, um, as well as outside stakeholders, helped um, publish that report. And what we found was really, um, and this is something we had seen really, but um, older drugs, older sterile injectables especially, are, are the majority of our shortages. Um, you know, they're less profitable, profitable products. They're made on the same lines as many other drugs. And quality has really been the main reason for shortage through the years. So looking back even 10 years, um, quality issues. And that can be quality either with the manufacturing site. So if it's an older site, it's you know, maybe 50 years old and, and needs remediation, um, or product defects. So things like particulate getting into a sterile injectable or a sterility issue occurring on the line, um, that type of thing. That, those are really, unfortunately, common things that can happen. Um, and as you know, I think, um, you know, during the pandemic, we had this huge, huge increase in demand for certain drugs, which really exacerbated the problem. And coming out of, of all of that and, and coming out of that very high rate of hospitalizations and high rate of demand, um, what we're seeing now is with the vaccine production at this huge level, which is um, often made on the same lines as other drugs. So we're having some displacement issues now. So some of our our kind of workhorse drugs that are made on those same lines are, are getting displaced because of capacity limitations at those sites. We also have a huge um, demand for commodities, so it's stoppers and vials, glass vials, um, even the filters that are used on the manufacturing lines. So we're seeing things right now at, at really kind of the worst point we've been in in, in quite a few years because of all of that. Um, you know, that being said, I, I know um, we're, we're working very, very closely with the manufacturers, but, but um, that's really where we're at right now. Okay. So it's, it sounds a little bit like maybe manufacturing capacity issues. We know, I know a lot of um, some of these facilities can be located in locations that have things like hurricanes and a lot of natural disasters, and that can certainly um, impact the manufacturing capacity and then, you know, quality and safety issues, as you mentioned. Um, Suzanne, one thing Val didn't mention, but I've read about this and I've heard about this, is potentially also the role that uh, GPOs, group purchasing organizations, might also play mm -hmm. that can unfortunately contribute to to some of these shortages. Any insights on that? Um, again, that can be a whole conversation, but um, how that plays into shortages that we see at the unit level and at the patient level is um, group purchasing organizations, hospitals are, a, uh, every hospital is a part of some GPO at some level. And so what hospitals did is they found that they got better pricing from manufacturers and distributors if they purchased in bulk, almost like what we do when we go to Costco. You know, if we buy in bulk, we get it cheaper than if we're just going to the grocery store and we're buying one. And so what happens, though, is um, one of the contractors within the GPO, and unfortunately, GPOs tend to give exclusive contracts. So they don't have multiple vendors that they work with. So they have this exclusive contract for this set of equipment or this set of tubing or syringes or whatever, and then something happens to that supplier. Well, then all of a sudden, 
the GPO has to scramble to figure out where they're going to get that supply because their exclusive contract supplier can't meet the demand. And then it has a downstream effect to the unit and hospital level. Yeah. And I know uh, for some hospital organizations I've heard too who, who work with the GPOs, they sometimes feel as though the neonatal intensive care unit we know is different than other units and yep. they are not tiny adults. Correct. And so what is purchased in group in bulk for adults is not necessarily the best thing that's going to work for a NICU patient. Yeah, absolutely. Nor is it the safest. Um, as the coalition, for those of you who have been a part of the coalition for many years, as we saw with the infant um, design of syringes and tubings, it is not the safest solution for neonatal and pediatric populations. But that seems to be going forward despite the safety concerns for our populations. Yeah. So Val, you mentioned that, you know, drug shortages aren't new. So can you talk about how the landscape has changed, you know, as long as you've been working in the industry? Sure. So I've um, been with the shortage program since we developed it back in 1999. That's when I joined the FDA. And uh, we, we formed the shortage program because my, my boss at the time was a TB specialist and we were seeing t shortages of TB drugs. And so we look, looked into why that was happening and what we could do about it and, and developed our program. And um, I should mention, so we're with the Center of Drugs and then there's also a, a Center for Biologics um, shortage program that deals with, with vaccine shortages um, and blood related products. And then there's a, a Center for Devices shortage program as well. And then, of course, our Center for Foods, we have a large team working on, on the foods and the infant formula issues. But So our program, um, through the years, since we developed it, um, we saw a handful of shortages, really, you know, at each year. And, and it was, you know, something where we continued to work with the manufacturers. And, and then we had a very large spike in shortages in 2011 when we had three large generic manufacturers that went down at the same time. Um, if any of you remember that time, we had a... a enormous shortage of phosphate and zinc and things that were absolutely needed for neonatal care. It was, it was horrible. Um, and then after, after that time, things got a little better. And then, of course, um, you know, now we're seeing our picture today is, is, is really, um, you know, we're seeing things worsen. And I think um, our, our, our success story is we're able to prevent many shortages. So we actually had a, a, a spike in uh, the largest number of prevented shortages that we've ever had in 2021, which is surprising. Um, but it was really through the collaboration with manufacturers and really having that close communication. Um, the new shortages in the past year, two years, even during the pandemic, have been down, They've, it, even though it doesn't seem that way at all. Um, we had 38 new shortages last year and um, around the same 43 the, the year before. But the types of shortages that we've seen have just been Critical. They've been so impactful. It's it's been drugs that you know we absolutely need. IV fluids, as we've mentioned, and and dextrose and things that that are absolutely critical. Um, IV contrast was another one that that showed up. Um, so the 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 thing that really troubles us, the most concerning thing, is the ongoing shortages, the ones that have lasted for years in some cases, and we just have not been able to to resolve them and get them resolved. And um, so I think right now that's our, our primary goal is, is getting that, you know, getting firms to increase the capacity, getting them to make those changes in their plants that, that would help this, this whole situation get better. So talk a little bit more about that. Talk about exactly what the role of the drug shortage staff is at FDA and what type of advice are you telling manufacturers to help them avoid not to just get through mm -hmm. a shortage, but how do you avoid a shortage? Sure. So um, our role really is our, our drug shortage team is, is 15 people that I, I manage. Um, and that sounds small, but there's a large, large team of experts. So we have our microbiologists, our chemists, and anyone we need to bring into that specific shortage. But um, when we hear about a shortage, and hopefully that's from the manufacturer, there's a legal requirement that companies notify us when they're going to have some type of supply disruption. Um, and that's since 2012. Um, so once they notify us that there's going to be an issue, then um, we, we work with them. With it. You know, whatever issue that, that is, if it's a quality problem with, in the plant or if it's a quality problem with the, with the product itself, um, we'll work with them on that and see if we can 
have the product released with maybe a Dear Healthcare Professional letter if it's something that needs to be done at the bedside. Or, um, for example, we've had several issues with particulate where there's been either metal particles or something that broke off on the manufacturing line and got in the product. But um, it's not a risk as long as you can mitigate it with a filter. So the, we've had the firms um, qualify a filter to be used and then um, a specific instruction goes to um, nurses and, and um, physicians, pharmacists to make sure that, that that filter is used with the product. So that's just one example, but um, across the board, there's multiple examples of, of that type of thing happening. Um, the other thing that we do is expedite review. So right now, as we're trying to get companies to add capacity, add manufacturing lines, add um, suites or um, even facilities, then we're expediting review of anything that will help with, um, with adding that capacity. So anything that will help with the shortage. And a another um, tool that we have is, is import. So um, that's, it's been successful. So when we have um, a, a long-term shortage or a shortage that's not able to be mitigated with our current U.S. manufacturers, then we look to our overseas counterparts and we'll work um, with them to identify product overseas that we can temporarily import until we can get the approved manufacturers um, back up to speed. And so an example of that um, in the neonatal community would be cefotaxime. We've, we've had an ongoing in, import of cefotaxime because our U.S. manufacturers haven't been able to produce that. So we'll continue that as long as we have to, as long as, um, as we need to. So um, those are kind of our, our mitigation tools, all, all, everything that we do with the firms. And then, of course, um, as you asked, I think, I think we, we want to make sure, too, we're telling firms what, what they need to do. So um, one thing that uh, was helpful recently, we had new legislation in the CARES Act that um, requires companies to have risk mitigation plans. So they have to think about the vulnerability in their supply chain and, and look at you know, where they need to have flexibility or, or um, resiliency in, in their supply operations and you know, make changes based on that. And so we're encouraging that. We put out guidance um, in May, and we're really hoping firms um, really you know, meet, meet that requirement and, and work on those issues. So that's, that's one thing we're doing. So this is a little bit of a personal anecdote here. I have um, good friends who recently adopted a baby that was born 24 weeks, three days, um, spent a lot of time in the NICU, and it turns out actually uh, Dr. Sullivan rounded on that baby, I found out last night. It's in Florida. Um, uh, she was at Shands. Um, but the baby was otherwise ready to go home, but um, potentially there was a problem with the oxygen unit that she needed to go home with. And I think that it wasn't necessarily that there weren't enough units, but that perhaps there wasn't the staff there to appropriately train the parents and get the babies ready to go home because they were going to have to be monitored. Um, and so my friend had just mentioned, you know, uh, they were very fortunate that a friend of theirs had this machine left over, that they never returned to a hospital, and the insurance went ahead and paid for it. So they were able to get this machine from their friend, but that there were seven other babies waiting to go home. So seven other babies, and you know, Dr. Sullivan said to me last night, yeah, try explaining that to a family right. when they need to stay there for an extra two weeks to wait, you know, whether it, for it's the device or for the home, uh, there to be enough home health workers to come right. and do their job. So um, Suzanne then, how do you find workarounds when you come to these types of things? Like how do you figure out what your workaround is? So. Nurses and physicians have been innovative at the bedside for years. If anyone can find a workaround, we can. <laughs> um, and, and so it just really, it, it, it really takes the collective mind. Um, so again, in the in morning huddle, when we're all together, um, I am thinking specifically of the large level four that I cover patients at, you know, we're talking 60 babies and there's easily eight to 10 of us caring for those 60 babies from a provider perspective. And it's like, okay, how, how are we going to handle this? So for instance, things like when the ABG cartridges went on back order, and so it's like, okay, so we can't do as many blood gases. How can we safely observe and manage respiratory status in our patients? So we 
made some phone calls and we got some transcutaneous um, carbon dioxide monitors and got some relatively quick training for our nursing staff and respiratory staff. So that way then we could wean ventilators based on transcutaneous readings versus drawing blood gases all the time. And so then we were able to minimize the utilization of one product by ramping up something that we hadn't really employed in that unit before, but the technology was there. So really um, trying to creatively work collectively to figure out how to not compromise care, but to get what we need for the patients, even if we're in short supply of something. Um, the other thing would be, oh, so something else that um, I've recently seen, especially in larger metropolitan areas, is a lot of the directors or managers of neonatal intensive care units, many times they will have like communities, whether it's on Facebook or social media somewhere. And so they're now bartering for supplies. So um, I recently witnessed, you know, a charge nurse calling up a hospital across the city because we were out of umbilical trays and it's like, hey, I need you know five umbilical trays to get us through until Tuesday. Here's what I can give you in return. And <laughs> and so um, it, it it you know we figure out a way. Yeah, you figure out a way, but it's not the ideal way. No, of course. absolutely not. not absolutely ideal. not. Um, so I think, so uh, we have video remarks from Susan Main, um, who is for the, uh, at the Center for Applied Nutrition, I think is what it's called, and she's going to talk to us a little about the infant formula shortage, but I did, before we do that, want to give a couple of minutes for questions, um, if anybody has any for Suzanne and Val. Mm -hmm. and, the nurse and with the extent of the most recent shortages, um, such as trace elements, I mean neonatal trace elements, right. we haven't had those for months. Mm -hmm. um, our hospital started to come up with a contingency plan for what are we going to do when we can't use, there's going to be no TPO. You know, it's just not going to be an option for us anymore because it just seems like that's the path that's going down with these shortages. Yeah, I'll respond. So I, I, I hear you. I, I, we know these, these TPN component shortages have, have really worsened, in the, in, especially in the, in the past couple of years even. Um, they've been an ongoing problem for years, though. I think, um, you know, the answer here for, for those products is they aren't made by, there are very few firms making them. Um, and it's, it is, again, it's, it's a capacity issue. It's, it's trade-offs. And so we need to, you know, continue to, to you know, vouch, we, we need to continue to tell firms we, we need these drugs. They're absolutely needed, and anything that the firm can do to increase supply, you know, we'll, we'll help with, and, and we continue to send that message. I think, you know, we, we talk to Aspen quite a bit. Um, they're a regular um, communicator, so we, we hear from your community, and, and we hear you. These are critical drugs, and we have to do everything we can to, to resolve this. Any other questions? All right, well, let's go ahead and look at the remarks from Dr. Main. Hello, I'm Susan Main, and I direct the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you today. I know the National Coalition for Infant Health does important work in promoting care for premature infants and their families. Infants are one of our most vulnerable populations, so your work is critically important to us. We agree with your coalition that access to human milk must be encouraged, but also recognize that many infants in the U.S. rely on infant formula for some or all of their nutrition. 
For infants with special medical needs, access to critically needed specialty, extensively hydrolyzed, amino acid-based, and metabolic formulas is of utmost importance. That is why we have stringent requirements in place for infant formula to make sure it is safe from both a food safety and a nutrition perspective. The FDA does not approve infant formulas. However, infant formula manufacturers must notify the FDA before marketing a new formula. The FDA reviews these notifications to make sure they meet federal nutrient and label requirements, as well as food safety standards that include packaging and ingredients. If they do not, the formula is defined as adulterated, and the FDA has the authority to take enforcement action if it is marketed. Among the requirements for infant formulas, the FDA specifies 30 nutrients that must be included in infant formulas. There are minimum amounts for all 30 nutrients and maximum amounts for 10 nutrients. FDA has specific requirements for labeling infant formulas. Information that is most helpful for caregivers of infants include directions for preparation and use, a pictogram showing the major steps for preparing infant formula, use by date, and instructions indicating whether water should be added. As you know, production and distribution issues related to the COVID-19 pandemic led to reduced supplies of infant formula in some parts of the country beginning in 2020. This was further impacted in February of this year by problems found at Abbott Nutrition's Sturgis, Michigan facility, a major producer of infant formula. The problems led Abbott Nutrition to voluntarily shut down production at this facility in February of this year. Since then, we have worked intensively towards our goal of ensuring that parents and caregivers can readily find safe and nutritious formula for infants. Since February, the FDA and USDA have been working closely with other infant formula manufacturers who are currently providing formula to the U.S. market to increase production domestically and in their manufacturing facilities abroad, and to prioritize product lines that are of greatest need, particularly specialty formulas. In addition, we've worked with other government agencies, such as the U.S. Department of Agriculture, states, tribal nations, and territories across the country to ensure that families who participate in the Women, Infants, and Children Program, or WIC, can use their benefits to purchase additional types of formula. This has been a top priority, and many of our staff work days, nights, and weekends to respond to the infant formula shortage. We also work with Abbott Nutrition to address the problems found at the Sturgis facility so that it could safely resume production, and we continue to monitor operations at the facility carefully. Another very important step we took was to provide increased flexibilities on a temporary basis to increase infant formula supplies to further augment the increases we were seeking through greater production of manufacturers who were already supplying the U.S. market. In May, we outlined a process by which the agency would not object to the importation of certain infant formula products that were intended for a foreign market. The increased flexibilities also applied to the distribution in the U.S. of products manufactured here for export to foreign countries. We prioritized granting these flexibilities to critically needed specialty, extensively hydrolyzed amino acid-based, and metabolic formulas. We are carrying out this process very carefully. Manufacturers are required to provide us with detailed information so that we can evaluate the infant formula to be sure that it is safe and nutritionally adequate. For example, we require that manufacturers provide us with a list of all nutrients and ingredients and microbiological testing. Since mid-May, we have now exercised enforcement discretion for formulas from nine countries. Most recently, on August 10th, we announced that we are allowing base powder for pure amino hypoallergenic infant formula to be imported, adding almost half a million cans, equivalent to six million full-size eight-ounce bottles. That brings us to a total of almost 19 million cans of formula and 400 million bottles. We have worked with the White House on Operation Fly Formula. Under this program, federal partners have worked together to transport products from manufacturing facilities abroad. Bypassing regular air freighting routes has cut a transportation process that typically takes three to four weeks 
down to approximately three days, speeding up the importation and distribution of formula. We continue to work with manufacturers and suppliers regarding additional supply to ensure there's adequate infant formula available wherever and whenever parents and caregivers need it. We've also provided several resources to help consumers, industry, and health professionals to keep them informed and to help them address the shortages. We created a web page to provide the public with information on which new formulas have been made available through this process. The availability of new formulas has been very helpful for retailers who now have new options available to help keep their shelves stocked. We also created an infographic with tips for preparing imported infant formula, since there may be variations in measurements, for example. That is because many of these formulas come from countries such as in Europe, for example, where they use the metric system. And we provided information to healthcare providers to help their patients obtain access to medically necessary specialty, amino acid-based, and metabolic infant formula products. It's very important, of course, to make sure we have adequate supplies of infant formula in the future. We need to encourage diversification of infant formula manufacturers so that a problem with one manufacturer doesn't significantly affect the infant formula supply. We are strengthening our infant formula regulatory program by hiring additional infant formula review staff with new resources we received from Congress earlier this year. We also are providing a pathway for companies that import, sell, and distribute formula under the FDA's temporary enforcement discretion policy to continue to supply infant formula to the U.S. past November 14th, which is the last date for us to provide the flexibilities currently in place. The FDA expects that the measures and steps it is taking with infant formula manufacturers and others will mean more and more supply is on the way or on store shelves moving forward. Thank you. So Val and Dr. Main, I know sometimes we hit the FDA with a lot of tough questions and it's difficult for people to understand you know, what role FDA plays, but really you're working behind the scenes um, to ensure that uh, we can get through the drug shortages, that we can try to mitigate them, and that we don't have them in the future. And it sounds like very similar to what Dr. Main was talking about with what they do with um, infant formula, working very closely with the manufacturers and to ensure that we are getting the safest products in uh, the quickest way possible to our most vulnerable infants. So Suzanne and Val, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. And um, with that, I am just gonna real quickly say how much I appreciate everybody coming today um, and supporting the coalition. And I am gonna turn it over to Mitch Goldstein, who's gonna deliver just a couple of minutes of our closing remarks. This brings us to the close of the eighth annual Infant Health Policy Summit. We covered a lot today, the black maternal health crisis. We must remember the historical basis of this issue, work on improving access in the present, and never let this be deprioritized in the future. Infant and maternal health disparities. The progress is not enough. We advocate, but the words must become actions. Infant health care teams, we must achieve whole person care for infants and their families in NICUs. And the burden of RSV. RSV is not going away, yet access to effective prophylaxis is still limited. We must continue to advocate for effective solutions. Human donor milk safety. This is a critical need biologic, not simply a food source. Our most at-risk infants depend on it. And formula and product shortages. If you have not seen the May 22nd, 2022 60 Minutes segment entitled In Short Supply, I would encourage you to watch it. The shortages of these critical need products should never happen. We must eliminate the safe harbor that facilitates GPO-mediated sole sourcing. I know I've learned a great deal, and I hope all of you did as well. 
I want to say a special thank you to our sponsors who made it possible for us all to come together today. And thank you, most of all, to our speakers. Sharing their knowledge and experience with us gave us a trove of insights and helped sharpen our goals for the months ahead. And finally, a huge thank you for those who are joining us virtually and in person today. We all lead busy lives by simply taking the time to be here. You've shown your commitment to finding solutions and improving the lives of infants all across this country. We are excited to work alongside of you, each of you, to benefit infants as we move forward. Thank you once again. Let me say this. The challenges and barriers that we've discussed today are daunting. The solutions are neither simple nor quick. But whether it's developing preventive treatments for reducing health disparities, we have a tremendous opportunity, even a calling, to use our time and energy to impact infants positively. As we work alongside you, advocating together, we know that the future of infants everywhere becomes brighter and brighter. Our time together may be drawing to a close, but our work on behalf of these infants does not stop here. In the months ahead, let's push forward, advocate for policies to protect infants, increase awareness, and alleviate burdens in both infant and maternal, maternal health. If you're interested in learning more about these topics we've discussed today, you can visit the National Coalition for Infants Health's website at infanthealth.org, that's all one word, or feel free to speak to one of our team leaders on your way out. And again, we look forward to seeing you all next year. Thank you.